Atchison Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you that we are all able to gather like this to, for this very integral meeting in our country's development. I would like to ask you to bless our proceedings, to bless and guide each and every one of us and to keep us as we go through today. All these things I ask in the name of your son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so now we will begin with today's proceedings. Now, firstly, as I said before, I would like to thank you all for being here as we go through today's program. We are today discussing labor market. Well, our theme for today is the labor market reimagined for development post COVID-2019. And I would like to say that I think everyone agrees with me when we say that 2019 has changed the way we think about a lot of things. Um, it has changed how we work, how we go to school, and things are just not the same like it used to be. And so as we go forward, we need to think about what does this mean for our labor market? Uh, persons are now working from home. As a matter of fact, work has moved from being a place to a thing. And how do we navigate these new waters going forward? How do we inform our students who are now considering careers? What should I do? What, should, what jobs were relevant two, three years ago that may not be relevant in another two, three, four years? Um, what are the new skills that we need to develop? And so a discussion of this nature is very critical and very timely. And so I'd like to thank you all for being here. And we look forward to the discussion that will ensue from the various presentations that we will have today. And also I'd like to state that I would also want you to listen carefully to all the presentations because there could be a little something for listening. And so at this point, I would like to know invite our Director General from the Planning Institute, Planning Institute of Jamaica, Dr. Wayne Henry, to give the opening remarks. Dr. Henry, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Antoinette Richards, uh, moderator. It does an excellent job as usual. We want to thank you, everyone, for, for joining um, and participating in today's forum. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to bring remarks uh, at the Labor Market Forum. I like the theme as we begin to reimagine the labor market post COVID, huh? um, you know, for development post COVID. I think the, this year's forum comes at a significant time, particularly because of the pandemic. Huh? We, the COVID pandemic has dealt a severe blow um, to the labor market globally. Um, and Jamaica is no exception. You, you think of the impact on labor um, from both, it's, it's the, the labor market has suffered from both supply and demand shocks um, to, because of the COVID pandemic. So, so as you think of persons being affected by the virus, you think of measures put in place to contain the spread um, that would represent supply shocks, uh, uh, shocks to labor supply. And then as you think of the, the impact on aggregate demand, for goods and services then you're thinking of then the overall demand shock and so to put in context for jamaica when we think of the 08 crisis the global economic and financial crisis that ran from 2008 to about 2012 we in jamaica there was a loss of some 90,900 jobs over 90,000 jobs were lost during that time and, and we estimated it took us maybe some seven eight years to recover in terms of the employment the labor market as we think of the COVID pandemic, we, we've seen where since March, you know, the first case in Jamaica, uh, you know, confirmed case in March 2020, until we did the labor force, the starting did the labor force survey in July 2020, we lost some 135,000, I think 600 jobs, over 135,000 jobs. So, so compared to over 90,000 jobs in a four year, three to four year period, compared to 135,000 jobs in a three to four month period. So it's a severe impact. And then as you look at what's happening, we've been forced 
I think, um, to rely more on technology, you know, education system, doing business, etc. And then, and then what the pandemic is showing that it can exacerbate or worsen inequality because not everyone has the same capacity to respond. Not everyone has the wherewithal, whether, whether in terms of technology, devices, or just connectivity. And that's a concern we have across sectors. And particularly in the labor market, uh, persons can be left behind if they can't participate remotely. They don't have reliable connectivity. If they don't have the wherewithal, uh, then it becomes very difficult. And so we have to now begin to deliberate how do we move forward. And then as we are, we are forced, um, even though we had the digital agenda on our radars, uh, it's been accelerated and pronounced because of the, the, the pandemic. And so we begin to think about what will that mean for the labor, the labor market in terms of um, the infu greater infusion and reliance on technology. And while there are many benefits, there are going to be implications that we'll have to treat with uh, from a labor, labor market standpoint. And then finally, we'll think about the disruption. Uh, we, well, we, we normally have in our cross here is, you know, for some foresighting when we begin to anticipate jobs of the future and begin to position uh, our training and education services to, to meet those anticipated needs. But then when we think of the disruption to training and education, uh, a lot of that may not show up now in terms of any fallout if we don't bring sufficient intervention uh, to treat with uh, this disruption in education and training, then it's going to show up certainly um, down the road uh, because one of your, your best predictors um, and, and your, one of your best Phillips, if, as it were, for development and to realize development outcomes is, is education. You and capital um, um, development. And so, so we, we look forward to the discussion today. We want to thank uh, those who are, who are presenting, those uh, who are um, those, those participating. We want to thank them for, for being here and taking the time. We want to thank you all for tuning in. And we, we look forward to a very rich discussion, very vibrant, with very healthy, meaningful outcomes. Um, and from that, um, that we can even make policy recommendations and prescriptions. So thank you very much. Over to you again, Antoinette. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. You have certainly um, put into context why this program is so important, why the topic we are discussing today is so important at this time. And so at this point, we would like to move into our first presenter. Our first presenter is Miss Kamika Fairclough, and she is from the Heart Trust NSTA. Ms. Fairclough is a research specialist with much of her experience and specialization in labor market research. She is currently employed to the Human Resource, the Human Employment and Resource Training, National Service Training Agency Trust, commonly called Heart NSTA Trust, as the manager of research and development, and has been a part of the research core for, for the last seven years. The key focus of the research activities during, the tenure, during her tenure has been in support of providing labor market intelligence, which is used to guide training and development. Pursuing this research agenda has been integral in streamlining program offerings and improving stakeholders and beneficiaries' experience in the labor market. Ms. Fairclough is motivated by national development plans and hopes to make continued contributions to Jamaica in her capacity. And Ms. Fairclough, she will be presenting on assessing the Jamaican labor market, what's next after COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Kimika Fairclough. Ms. Fairclough, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Richards. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I really want to thank PIOJ for this opportunity to be able to share with you some of the critical information that is needed as Jamaica re-emerges from the shock of COVID-19. I know Dr. Henry would have spoken at length, not at length, but would have really given some good context and content about some of the things that I will be presenting on. Screen check, is everything good? Is everybody seeing my presentation? Yes. You're good. You're good, Mrs. Fairclough. All right, let's go. 
so covering one second just to ensure that i have control all right let's go presentation the labor market and training implications of covid 19. now i know dr henry would have spoken to some of the things that i have here on screen as a result of covid 19 we would have seen extensive lockdowns severe unemployment spells Already we see Jamaica's unemployment rate moving from where we were about 7.8% at this time last year to about 12.6% is where we're at now in terms of unemployment. We've seen temporary income losses and a falling aggregate demand. If persons have less to spend, they will spend less. It's basically what we're experiencing. And naturally we have seen a disruption in training and education, especially as it relates to TIVET because a lot of what TIVET does is hard to facilitate through an online, through online. So we have seen a lot of disruption in training and education. Now, as a result of that, or as a result of these impacts, ladies and gentlemen, we have noticed, or the World Economic Forum from the IMF has projected major contraction, even from the global side in, in 2020, as you see on screen, the contraction that was projected was at 4.9%. 4 but all of the indexes that are here are showing that we are anticipating some level of growth for the next year, the next financial year, 2021. Whether it is from the advanced economy or emerging markets, we're anticipating that there will be growth. But this growth must meet preparedness. For us as a small country, for us as a, as a developing economy, growth must meet preparation and preparation needs information. As a result of this, ladies and gentlemen, let me invite you to look at some of the things that are driving change in the labor market. So now that you have seen the projection for growth, as long as there is not a major resurgence of the virus, we are hoping that markets will be reopened and that persons will be re-engaged in employment on a basis where productivity can be increased and improved. Now, these are some of the things that are driving the, the, the labor market on a major scale. The one that heads the list is COVID-19. COVID-19 has changed the way in which people work, in which, the ways in which people do business and the ways in which people go to school. Telecommuting has become the new order of the day. Today I am working and I, and I am at home. Now persons may have had this policy on their books for a while, but the rate at which COVID-19 has accelerated these realities means that, ladies and gentlemen, we must be prepared for changes at any pace and at any speed. We're talking about people doing more business online, the growth of e-commerce, and that came as a result of COVID-19 persons who would have been unemployed or persons who would have lost their job during the time of COVID and would have started their own online businesses. We're seeing growth in that. Now, because of this major growth, we attribute all of that to what we call the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. I know presentations after this will go deeper than I am able to at the moment. So because of the industry 4.0, the infusion of technology has become so great. It has, it has gone on a scale so wide that if you are not technologically savvy, if you do not have digital literacy and have digital skills, you will be left behind. It is a sad reality, but it is one that we must own and accept in this time. How is it that we prepare our labor market to know about technology, to become digital literate? Normally literacy and numeracy would be the order of the day. But no, if you're not digitally literate, you will be left behind. We're talking about the Generation Z and the millennials who are also, who will be the labor force of tomorrow. Already they are technologically savvy. They will be your employers. They will be our employees. And if already they are so fast paced in terms of what the technology looks like, it shows us that technology is driving, even, even at that age, that technology is driving everything that we do and everything that we become, how we learn, how we interact and how we do business. And because Generation Z or the millennials is the labor force of tomorrow, it is important that we get on with these skills as well. How is it that we nurture them to see that 
good use and the not so good use of technology. We're talking about new media and we're talking about new media. We're talking about how social media has joined the media platform to become a business tool and a tool of communication. Social media has become a platform for which persons do business and even educate themselves. So social media one time would have been seen as a place where people go for gossip. It is much more than that. It has become a platform for people to anchor their businesses. Those businesses that survived, those small businesses that survived COVID-19 are the businesses that had a face on social media where persons could go out and make their orders and get products from persons who had a representation on the media. And we're talking about health and safety. Because of COVID-19, two of the most important realities are, pre are persons' health and their safety. The persons are not going to go in a space where they jeopardize their health and, and, and safety. And as a result of that, whereas initially our personal space was three feet, our personal space has become six feet and more. And so our workplaces must be designed with that in mind. Persons will not go to work in a place where it is clustered or it does not give them the comfort that they are safe. So now that we have dealt with some of the things, some of the things that are driving the labor market on a major on a major basis. We want to talk about how is it that we respond from both the labor side and the, the from both, sorry, from both the demand side and the supply side. How is it that we respond during this pandemic? From the demand side, let's talk about five of the things that can be implemented to help resurge the labor market or help the labor market to normalize. We talk about creating incentive for job creation. It's not in my hand, naturally, because I am not so endowed, but for those who can create incentives for job creation, the more people think that they are being rewarded for doing these things, is the more that they will be driven to do it. Talking about offering wage subsidies. I know you're seeing my screen, so I don't have to read everything. But let me emphasize workforce reallocation. Where it is that most persons would have lost their job, it is important that some of these persons are reskilled, retooled, upskilled, and, and those labor, and that labor is carried to, um, to sectors that demand them the most. So the sectors that don't demand them now are the sectors that do not need these people now. Persons can be retrained, reskilled, recertified, and be taken into these sectors to be absorbed by these sectors that need them most talking about creating unemployment insurance, as well as enabling secure work environment. We spoke about it a few seconds ago. How is it that we make people safe when they come to work? Creating flexible work practices and robust hygiene and sanitation practices. Now from the supply side, this is where those who are listening to me, if you have a talent to offer to the labor market, this is where you come in. These are some of the considerations that you must make as an employee or as somebody who wants to work on work, wants to work as an entrepreneur. Now, these are some of the important responses that must be taken by persons who are on the supply side. Certification of the uncertified workforce is integral. Now, persons are listening to me may think that it is redundant to certify themselves at this time when there is a lull in the, in, in the amount of employment activities that are happening. But there is no better time than now to, for persons to get M, um, certification and for persons to become recertified in areas that they weren't certified. And why I say this, when market, activity begin, market activities begin to normalize, Employers are looking for the best skills, the best talents. If you are uncertified, if you are unqualified, you will find it most difficult to respond where there are vacancies or where there, are, where there is demand from the labor market. We're talking about reskilling, upskilling, and the retooling of the labor force. Reskilling, we mean giving skills or allowing persons to learn skills that otherwise they did not have. Upskilling is adding to their complement of skills and retooling is almost the same thing as um, reskilling, but giving persons different tools that they need to respond to the changes and the dynamics of the labor market. Reskilling is extremely important. No, there are persons who would have lost their jobs, not only because of COVID, but because they could not respond 
to the, dynamic, the dynamics of and the changes of the labor market at this time. They don't know how to use a computer when a computer is all that is needed to be used for the job. They don't know how to use something that is technical and technological. So they will be left behind because this is all that is needed for the job at this point. So reskilling, upskilling and retooling is very vital at this time. We're talking about training of the most vulnerable workers through short courses um, at this time. And by vulnerable workers, we're talking about those with the least experiences. We're talking about persons who are probably the older ones in the labor force. We're talking about persons with disabilities. Those are persons we consider to be vulnerable workers. So we're talking about having some short courses for these persons or persons accessing these short courses so that they can complement the skills that they have so that when there is reopening of the markets and when that they, will, they may be attractive to employers as well as creating their own um, employment. To, and it leads me to the next point, self-employment and entrepreneurship. This is what I believe to an extent would have saved um, a part of our economy. Those who would have been laid off as a result of COVID-19, those who would have lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19, turned to the talents that they have and began doing their own thing. Um, on social media, every scroll, scroll you scroll is a new person with a new business idea, doing something because they need a source of income. Now, this culture of entrepreneurship must be greatly driven and supported. There must be infrastructure for this culture so that it can continue to promote economic growth and even promote well-being of our citizens. And as, and as such, it is important that those who are under the hearing of my voice can know that working for yourself is one of the most empowering things, not to diminish persons who work for others, because I am one who works for who, who work for someone else, but it is something that gives you some level of security. Right, and we're talking about online job matching, counseling, and labor market information. This is a timely forum. Persons who are hearing, persons who are listening, can do have the opportunity to see what are some of the best next steps that they can take to see how is it that we can approach the changes and the dynamism of the labor market? How is it that we can get information that can help us to make decisions about our employment and career choice? Right, so these are the supply side measures. We want to quickly look at the retooling and upskilling of the labor market and some of the must have skills. Remember, we spoke about refilling, upskilling, retooling. And for this to happen, persons need to be of an adaptable and flexible mind. Employers are looking for persons most adaptable persons who are most flexible so that if you are put in a situation or something is withdrawn from you or there is change in the labor market, shocks in the labor market, you can respond to these. We're talking about those who are creative and innovative, persons who will come up with the next idea to solve the next big problem. Retooling and upskilling the labor market cannot be done with, without these integral skills. Tech savviness. It is not only knowing that a computer is a computer and knowing the parts of a computer. It's having the awareness of how to maneuver and manipulate these things. How is it that you take up a tablet and it then, is... Uh, um, how is it that we take up a tablet and it is used for the, the good, uh, for your good, for business operation, for good communication? And we come down to the point of communication. So these are four skills and we're adding an ex another four to it. Retooling and upskilling the labor market requires persons who are in tune with emotional intelligence. How is it that you respond and react to changes and diversification and things that are, are not in your comfort zone? How is it, and, and, to, and to give you a real example, we talk about moving people from one sector to the next, reallocation of workforce. Persons must be able to be in tune with um, emotional intelligence and know that this is for my good and also for the good of national development. And so reskilling and and up reskilling and retooling and and upskilling is not something that 
is a detriment to me, but I can accept it as a real change and make real contributions. We're talking about entrepreneurial skills and we spoke about it earlier. Digital skills. How is it that you decode something that is a picture into a message, having digital skill, meaning you are able to filter where information is good and information is not good. And we're talking about also time management. We spoke about eight critical skills that are needed for each and every person who will respond to retooling and upskilling of the labor market. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want, you to, I want to invite you into the second part of this presentation. We, talk, we spoke earlier about some of the strategies and the steps that must be taken for persons to be able to respond in a way that is vigorous, in a way that is robust to the changes and the dynamics of, of the labor market in this post-COVID time. If we're anticipating an economy of buoyancy, we need persons who are trained, persons who are certified, persons who are qualified, those who are adaptable to changes, those who are flexible, those who are digital literate, those who have an entrepreneurial mindset, those who can weather the storms, and those who know that even though this is a valley experience, a mountain is, they are anticipating a mountain movement. And those persons, and, and we, we spoke about that aspect. We, I want to invite you to look at some of the new and emerging areas, not only as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of the infusion of technology. Some of the occupational areas that are, that are coming on stream now as a result of changes in the labor market, some of the occupational areas that are seeing tremendous, not now, but we can anticipate that they will see tremendous growth as a result of where the labor market is going. I will discuss these as sector to sector, and we will be looking at these sectors of focus. These are some of the sectors that the, I know are priority areas for the government. We have our ICT, manufacturing, agriculture, global services, logistics, and tourism. Now, these six sectors are not the only six sectors in Jamaica, but as I say, they will be sectors of growth, sectors um, where we are expecting great, the greatest employment opportunities and we're expecting the greatest infusion of technology that can move persons from one dimension to the next. When we talk about ICT, these are the areas that today we'll, we'll be talking about artificial intelligence, networking and telecommunication, data protection and cybersecurity, and global services. Now to mention emerging areas, it is crucial to also mention emerging technologies because occupational areas tend to emerge where there are, or tend to be, be, to be new or emerging where there are major technological changes and infusion where there are major market movements where there may, may be rapid growth in a sector. Those are the things that cause areas to either be, be considered or classified as new or emerging. So before I touch on each slide that has a new or emerging area, we want to look at some of the new and emerging technologies associated with these sectors. So on the ICT, I know you're seeing my screen, so I don't have to read it, as well as the presentation will be made accessible to you. But just to highlight some of the big ones, 3D printers, non-humanoid robots, automation, machine and machine learning, virtual and augmented reality, and Siebel and network access control. So these are some of the major new and emerging technologies that are coming on stream and are changing the way in which persons work and do business, as well as changing some of the name and the classifications of occupations and some of the responsibilities of um, persons who are employed in the labor market. Now for the new and emerging areas, I could not exhaust the list today, mainly because I do not have the time as well as I would not want to bore you. So when we talk about the new and emerging areas on the ICT, these are some of the ones. And as I mentioned earlier, the list is not exhaustive. We have our process automation experts, and we know a lot of things have moved from manual to automated. And this is where our process automation experts would come in. How is it that you automate a process that is repetitive? How is it that you automate a process that does not need a human body? 
How is it that you make a process more efficient and effective? These are some of the experts that come into play. Excuse me. We're talking about our artificial intelligence developers and engineers, cybersecurity specialists, and you can see how everything interrelates content creators, robotics engineer, and our data architects. Now, as I said, the presentation will be made available to you and questions can be asked after. The next sector that we'll be looking at is logistics. And logistics in Jamaica, we classify it under four main subheadings. To my understanding, we have shipping or the maritime and freight, air aviation services, warehousing services, transportation, inland services. Now, logistics in Jamaica features these new and emerging technologies. We have our ASICUDA, which is the automated system for customs data. It is a comp computerized um, system that has been, I think, infused or by the UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, to administer the country's customs. So most, if not all countries who are treated to UNCTAD would have in, would have, had ASICUDA and Jamaica is one of them. So we are now using ASICUDA. We have virtual reality, augmented reality. We have blockchain technology, 3D printers also in logistics and a terminal operating system. As I said, not exhaustive, there are more. How these technologies have really impacted occupational areas. Let's take a look at some of the new and emerging areas. We have our data analysts for logistics. And in every sector, health and safety officers, remember we spoke about the driver of health and safety being extremely critical to people's well-being. Plumbers, chefs, bunker operators, hyperbaric welders, and hyperbaric welders, the other name for them are our underwater welders. For years, employers have been saying to us when we do the research, we need persons who can do deep diving, deep diving welding, persons who are able to weld underwater, mechatronics engineer, marine lab technicians, equipment operators. Global services sector, uh, many persons would know it as consisting BPO, meaning business process outsourcing, knowledge process outsourcing, legal process outsourcing to the global services sector. And when we talk about the global services sector, it is one, one of the sectors that really have been driving growth for Jamaica. A lot of jobs would have come on stream as a result of um, global services sector. And so it has and will remain as one of the government's priority areas. Let's look at one, some of the new and emerging technologies that are listed here. We have our robot process automation. Sometimes you pick up the phone and you think you're talking to somebody, you're actually talking to a machine. That is the infusion of robot process automation in place of um, a person who would have been sitting and just taking calls. We have our cloud technology, virtual reality, social media platform, voice recognition. And as a result of some of these technologies, we have these new and emerging areas. So BPO or GSS is not only for the local call center as we know it. I believe that the emphasis on the, of the government is to move some of these um, some of these lower level jobs to knowledge processing. So we have our content creators, project managers, we have web developers, software developers, digital marketing specialists among others, as you can see that is on screen. As for manufacturing, some of the new and emerging technologies, 3D printing. I remember when the virus just came and one of our local companies decided that they would be printing um, ventilators so as to be responsive. I know what I'm saying, in Jamaica? Yes, in Jamaica. 3D printing, programmable logic controller machines, telemetering, virtual reality, et cetera. Some of the new and emerging areas as a result, we have our 3D printing technicians, our fabricators, heavy vehicle mechanics, me me mechatronics engineers, sanitation and hygiene specialists, or agro processors. Remember, food security is a must, it is a big deal in this country. And as a result, agro processing is a necessity. All right. And uh, I believe finally, no, not finally, I have another sector. 
agriculture and some of the new and emerging technologies, air and soil sensors. We have drones or drone technology or crop sensors, cloning and seed hybridization, butane extraction, greenhouse farm, farming. I am running out of time, but I will get to it. And some of the new and emerging areas that are here, we have our farm management, our farm managers, wastewater managers, food security strategists, apiarists, equipment operators, agricultural engineers, irrigation specialists, and our drone pilots. And finally, not the forgotten sector, how is it that we will respond in terms of bringing tourism away from only sea and sand and adding products to the tourists? We know Jamaica is a well sought after destination. Persons will continue to come. However, we want to show you some of the new and emerging technologies that are here, as well as some of the new and emerging areas. And finally, this is the time I have with you, just for you to browse over some of the new and emerging areas. As I said, the presentation will be made available to you. I may have been getting too excited about what I want to stay in the time that I have been given. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I will hand over to the host, Ms. Richards. You may take the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Faircloth. Um, so I have a couple questions for you. Um, the first question is, so you have presented a lot of information on new and emerging areas in six critical sectors. And so my question is, how is the Heart NSTA Trust evolving to ensure that we have persons to meet these new and emerging areas, that we have trained persons to meet these areas? I can speak from the perspective that I sit to know that this kind of information is infused on a large basis to the training system. So the information that you have seen here today is information that we infuse in our curricula, in our standards. So to answer your question more directly, if I can, if I'm permitted to, to say, this information is also used to guide program planning and the direction in which the projections for the institutions go. I cannot speak too richly on the operation aspect of the organization because of where I sit. But I can say from where we are, this is the information that is infused into the training system so that persons are trained in the same respect that I'm offering these suggestions. Okay. Um, I, okay, I have Dr. Henry who has raised his hand. So Dr. Henry? I'm going to to unmute and ask your question. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very good, you know, comprehensive presentation, Ms. Fairclough. Uh, I liked it a lot. Just want to ask, and, and from a hard NSTA standpoint, the, the pandemic is, is forcing us, organizations, entities, and individuals to be more flexible, uh, to be more agile, you know, we have to pivot to be relevant, etc. How do you, how are you going about that in terms of training? Some of these attributes, uh, uh, you call them in some cases soft skills, but something like emotional intelligence, the need to be flexible. How do we, how do you infuse that, inculcate that in, in trainees? <laughs> Dr. Henry, I wish I could, I wish I could say more about the training aspect. Um, from the Heart Trust perspective, I know this is something that is largely operational. But as I was hinting previously, these recommendations for soft skills have have always been identified as shortcomings for our for our, for our graduates when we survey the labor market, when we listen to what the stakeholders are saying. And these have always been recommendations for training in terms of our, our stakeholders want to see our, our, um, our graduates to um, as more flexible, having more EQ, having more such and such and such. So the recommendation that is made from our team in research is normally sent to operations to make standards and curriculum to make them responsive to some of these shortcomings. So to honestly say, this is uh, something that 
we hope is infused in probably through simulations at, at, at a training institution, giving real life situation, um, giving persons on the job training, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the examples that I may be able to quote. I don't think I can sufficiently answer in terms of, because I know it is a question that is more targeted for the operational aspect of, um, of the trust. So I'm sorry, I don't have that information as to the specifics of how we get our trainees ready and responsive, but I do know that this information at best is infused in our standards and curricula as persons um, use them for training. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I have a question here from Mr. Neville Ying, and his question is, what are the strategies for education and training institutions in Jamaica to focus on employability rather than employment and the mix of hard and soft skills? What are the strategies the for education and training institutions in Jamaica to focus on employability rather than employment and also to ensure that we have a mix of both the hard and soft skills? Well, I guess you probably kind of discussed some of the soft skills in answering Dr. Henry's question, but the whole issue of moving from training for employment and training for employability. It's a good question. <laughs> but as I, I'm trying to hint, the, the, uh, the strategies that are used to um, prepare persons to not only be employable. No, you said to prepare persons not only for employment, but, but for employment. employable. Yeah. Uh, um, strategies that are employed, mm -hmm. <laughs> I cannot speak to them. I cannot speak to them not because I, I am inadequate or, or anything of that nature, only because I do not sit on that helm of the organization. My responsibilities mm -hmm. are, I, should, I will not say siloed, mm -hmm. but they are specific to providing the intelligence that is needed to um, create these strategies, so to speak. So what happens after this aspect is really on the operational side. Okay, well, I guess Mr. Ying's question is very It is critical. very critical. It is and very difficult. I think for Mr. Ying, what I would say is, it's something that, because at each labor market forum, there are takeaways that we at the PIOJ will keep, and then we will have discussions with partners moving forward about some of these things. So this is definitely one critical thing. So that I have to be two, very helpful. Right. So I, have <laughs> I, two I believe questions. I know persons who can answer these questions. I okay. don't know if they're in the audience. I don't mm -hmm. know if they have been invited, but I'm sure there are persons on the operational aspect that can profoundly answer these questions. I do not want to misrepresent my organization by saying something that I cannot speak to aptly, but I do know of persons who can adequately answer some of these questions. Okay, so I have two quick questions because time is against us. One, someone asked a question, Jerome, he asks, how can persons who aren't earning get qualified or certified in light of the cost attached to education? What I do know that for, or if, if the person is asking specifically about the, the agency, HART, there is absolutely no cost, just merely an administrative fee that is um, joined to our programs. Our programs are fully subsidized and persons can access our training. Um, through any regional office, they can apply online for training. They can show up at any of our regional offices. They can show up at any of our institutions, and they will they will be served there. I know if he's speaking specifically to the heart vocational training centers or any of our colleges, that the training is not at a cost to him because it has been fully subsidized. Okay, thank you. I, um, I see. I'm see. I see more as as we as we ask questions. I see more questions come in the chat. So there's even questions asking about hard certifying persons who are skilled in their area, but are illiterate. So they're very skilled. They're very good at what they do, but they're illiterate. And another question about is hard still doing on-site certifications at this time? So if you can take those two in one. All right. So as it, as it pertains to um, certified per, certifying persons who are professionals in the area, yes, we have that fast-paced certification where persons can be certified if they're a professional in the area without going through the um, the regular 
program, so to speak, but as it answers the part of illiteracy, what we do if that is identified. And as you know, we would have merged with the Jamaica Foundation for Lifelong Learning. So that is one of the steps that is taken to ensure that persons are literate and numerate. So persons who will not pass our standard um, tests that are issued, they are referred to the JFLL and steps are taken from there to ensure that persons are not only certified and qualified, but are also literate and numerate. Okay, and my final question would be, so the information you have presented, very important, very interesting, but I would like to know what steps are, is hard taking to provide this information to persons at the secondary level so okay. that as students are selecting courses and they're thinking about the what next, that this is being used to guide some of their decisions because we still have some of the old ideas as it relates to jobs and careers that you're gonna get. But how is this information now reaching where it matters so that these students make better choices in your selection and going forward? All right, so what I do know is that our, our even my team, from time to time we go to career days. We have relationship with some of these secondary schools and we go to career days and make these presentations, not on a very large scale. I must admit from where I sit, because there are times when we are called into the high schools to make these kinds of career presentations so we can guide persons into making better decisions about their career choices. As it relates to what the regional offices may do, I believe I can't speak 100%, but I can speak that where my department sits, there are times when we have to engage secondary schools at these career day forums. There are relationships that we have established over the years with different high schools and we go into these schools. I'm not sure if there's a program at the regional office, somebody can correct me if they're here from heart, if there's a program from the regional office's perspective where they go in to secondary schools and have these career day functions. But I do know that there is a career development unit that even the other day I was asked to make a presentation there that were targeting only high school um, students. So there are, there are some forums that are held. I'm not sure if it's regular or sporadic, but I know there are forums that are held that um, engage primarily secondary um, students and give them this critical information. Maybe it needs to be expounded or on a greater level or basis, but I do know that it exists. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, there are lots more questions we could ask, but then I have other presenters to come. So at this point, we will stop the presentation, we'll stop the questions for this section. I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you are most welcome. And thank yeah, you for there are me. I know may, I went over my time. Yeah, there are persons who may want to contact you further for additional yes, information. The, as she said, the presentations will be shared. Um, there's one thing I would like to note. Um, Dr. Ying, Prof. Ying, sorry, never Ying, his question about his question is a very interesting and important question. And depending on how the day runs, um, Prof. Ying, I hope you'll be on with us for the entire session. I would love to even give five minutes or so at the end of every all the presentations where we can look at some takeaways, some way forward. And I think your question is one of the key things that I would even I would like to have discussed further. So at that point, you will unmute yourself and you'll even talk more about that question because I think that whole issue is very critical as we go forward. Again, Ms. Ker Ms. Kerkhoff, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to our second presenter. And our second presenter is Dr. Truman Packard. Truman Packard is a lead economist in the World Bank Group where he has worked since 1997 and is currently serving as human development practice leader for Mexico. Dr. Packard has worked with Gov with governments in Latin America, Central Europe, and the East Asia Pacific to design policies and deliver programs that improve people's human capital and employment outcomes. Trained as a labor economist with a PhD from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, his published work 
focuses on how labor law and social insurance programs, that is retirement benefits, unemployment insurance, and health coverage affect people's incentives to work and save. As part of the World Bank's Labor Global Sol Solutions Group, he has focused mostly on how to improve labor regulation and social security to create jobs. Now, today, Mr. Pack Dr. Packard will be presenting on the changing nature of work in the post-COVID-19 age. But before we move on to Dr. Packard, there are two things I need to do. Um, there is a poll that we will have at the end of each presentation, and the poll will be coming up on your screen about now. And that poll you will use to vote and state what, you, what were your thoughts on Ms. Fairclough's presentation. Was it good? Was it excellent? Very good. You see it there. So please all just vote by that clicking. Thank you. I'm right, so right now we're seeing most of our votes. There are about 40, 50% of the voting. And we're ranging from excellent to very good. That's good, thank you, thank you. Any, any more votes? Good, good. Because the votes will be up for, the poll will be up for another 20 seconds. Okay, and great, and that's it. Thank you very much. And and we see our results here. Over eighty percent of the votes range the presentation from excellent to from very good to excellent. Thank you very much. Second thing I need to do. Remember, I said earlier that there is a prize for listening. Okay, so we have a question, and the question is related to. Ms. Fairclough's presentation. Now the first person to correctly answer the question in the chat will get a token. And the question is, name two retooling and upskilling areas of focus. So I hope you are taking notes from the presentation. So you can now go to the chat and put your answers in. It says, name two retooling and upskilling areas of focus. And she gave us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven possible options. So you just need to give me any two of those seven. Okay, and thank you very much. And at this point, we will now move on to Dr. Packard. So while you're entering, we have, we'll now have Dr. Packard. Okay, so Dr. Packard, over to you, it's your time. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And um, I'd like to take a moment to thank very much the organizers of this forum from PIOJ, uh, Dr. Wayne Henry, uh, Mrs. Deirdre Coy, and of course, Mrs. Antoinette Richards, who is our moderator. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the World Development Report from 2019, actually, prior to the pandemic, uh, on the changing nature of work. And I think that that's important uh, to do in, in that uh, many of the things that we are talking about today, about how the pandemic has uh, really changed the way we are working, changed the labor market, changed the economy, um, were actually uh, uh, trends and uh, deep structural changes that were already underway that were motivating a rich uh, discussion about uh, the nature of jobs and how technology could be 
put for uh, to good use for economic development. And one of the things that uh, that's important to keep in mind because it would be a mistake to think that the pandemic um, was the the root cause of of these changes that we will be living with for 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 many years. Um, but the pandemic certainly what it did was to um, to accelerate uh, those changes. And so what we have is a tech acceleration, if you will. Uh, the tech acceleration since uh, the, the lockdowns, uh, uh, and, and it's an acceleration of many of the trends that were already underway. Now, when we think about technology and the labor market, uh, one of the things that's important is that the process of technological change is something that we have always lived with as human beings and human societies. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it, it is a process that in many ways defines economic development itself. So um, conceptually, uh, you can think of technological change and jobs um, using this sort of graph where you have employment in each sector on the vertical axis and along the horizontal axis, you have sectors ordered in sequence by their um, vulnerability to automation. And by that, I mean where the, the uh, work, the nature of the work that is done in those sectors is very routine, uh, repeated, and uh, very um, intense in physical labor, uh, uh, intense in uh, physical, physical skills. So a good example of that is agriculture. And indeed, um, one of the best examples historically of uh, automation that dramatically uh, uh, changed the, the nature of a sector and, uh, and destroyed many jobs was the tractor, the coming of the tractor to agriculture. Um, it was a piece of automation. It put a lot of people um, out of work. Um, so there was a loss of employment in that sector. However, as a result of that, there was also an increase in um, uh, productivity that came from the innovations. You know, how do you uh, put the tractor to best use? Uh, what are the other activities that are then suddenly um, able to be done because people are no longer doing what now the tractor is doing? So as a result of that innovation, there's an increase in output, uh, hopefully uh, with greater productivity at lower costs so that the people who can consume the results of this labor um, are a larger share in the community, which creates greater job and therefore an expansion of employment, not only in the original sector affected by the automa um, automation, agriculture, but in new uh, sectors that are related um, uh, to, to, to agriculture, such as processing, uh, taking something that was the fruit of a field and then and, and adding value to it by uh, creating some new new product. Um, so that's kind of the process. And so it's important to keep that in mind because sometimes it can seem like the conversation about technology and, um, and technological change and automation is, is a very grim one, is a very pessimistic one. So it's important to keep that uh, positive outlook. Um, now, even before the pandemic, this this debate had been going on for years. You know, what are going to be the jobs that are going to be um, destroyed by a widespread automation? And what you see here are some of the estimates um, that were made as, as to the percentage of uh, jobs that would be lost from automation, from a selection of different countries in which the World Bank works. And what you can see from these estimates is that they range, the range of the estimates is, are quite wide. Um, no one really knows uh, what the impact will be on existing jobs. And of, of course, taking into account the new jobs that are created, this range can be uh, quite uncertain. So that's kind of important to keep in mind. Um, now, what is it exactly that is changing? Uh, you know, we do see the manifestation of technology. We do see uh, how we have more machines in the workplace. Um, but what are some of the more fundamental uh, dynamics that have been uh, underway for a long time that is leading to those very visible outcomes? One of the things that's very apparent is that the geography of where jobs uh, take place, where work is taking place has changed 
dramatically. What you see here is um, a illustration of the shift in where uh, manufacturing jobs have gone um, from the high income countries, uh, which is the orange line, uh, where uh, there were many manufacturing jobs at the start of the 1990s, um, those have been declining. And those jobs um, have been shifting to uh, manufacturing industries, mainly in the fast developing economies in East Asia. All the while, throughout this same period, although there have been this dramatic shift, the total share of, uh, of jobs, industry jobs globally and in the middle income countries has remained rather stable. So it's not so much that jobs are destroyed, it's just that different ways of producing go from some from certain places in the world to other places in the world, uh, taking those jobs, taking those jobs with them. I mean, certainly what is true is that there has been a decline in many countries uh, in many of the jobs that are mainly manual. Uh, so the, 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 the types of jobs that are the most susceptible to automation uh, to be done by machines are those that are um, very, very intense in a routine activity um, and uh, mainly those that involve uh, a, a, a high input of physical labor. Uh, and, and, and it does turn out that those are the, sh the, the jobs that appear to be disappearing uh, while uh, jobs that require um, more cognitive uh, input, more cognitive skills are the ones um, that have been increasing in share. Now, behind what we see with jobs, we also know that there has been uh, a, a huge change in the nature of firms, um, a huge change in the nature of, uh, of uh, businesses. Uh, what, what you see here is the um, track, the, 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 the timeline of development of certain large global companies like Ikea and Walmart and Taobao, uh, which is a, a Chinese uh, equivalent to Amazon. Um, now, what our observation, observation of what has changed is that companies can become very large and dominant players in the global economy very, very quickly. Uh, so if you see uh, how long it took Ikea and Walmart uh, over the course of many decades in order to gain their market share, a new upstart, a mainly digital, digital co company, Taobao, uh, was able to gain and surpass uh, that market dominance far faster um, and in a way that is very, very new. And it's something that we've been calling scale without mass. You know, it's not the physical presence, it's not the physical um, out, outlets uh, for products and physical presence in the market, it's a di mainly digital presence. And that's very, very new. Uh, let me see. For some reason, my presentation is now not moving. Ah, here we go. Um, another thing that's new is that uh, these market, the, these new market players, these new digital firms are able to dominate their uh, market very, very quickly. And what you see here are three examples of dominant digital firms. M-Pesa, which is a digital banking uh, firm that mainly exists in Africa. Uh, Airbnb, which you probably all know about. Uh, Didi Chongqing, which is a Chinese uh, equivalent to um, uh, Lyft or Uber. Um, and what we've done is we've uh, assigned them an index value of 100 according to their market share, and then shown their next largest analog competitor in the same market. So for example, in Airbnb, it would be the uh, Marriott uh, and Hilton chain of hotels. And what you see is that these digital firms have quickly become dominant players in the market. Um, but it's not very clear uh, where they exist legally. You know, do they exist in some particular constituency in some particular jurisdiction? Uh, they mainly exist in the cloud and that has important implications for things like regulation and taxation. Um, 
of course, we've all become far more familiar with uh, the new ways in which we are all going about our work day uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this was already happening prior to uh, the pandemic, uh, where we had technology and digital media really altering how people um, came to work every day um, and how they were able to participate not only in the workplace and in the in 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 value and production chains, but also in um, in events uh, uh, like uh, today's event. Um, now, what we have seen is that these digital technologies, uh, things like Zoom um, and other technologies, um, have affected. Uh, the labor market quite dramatically on the demand side, on the supply side, and the market as a whole. And what we've seen is changes in the structure of production, the space and time of work, and the distinction between what in economics we used to call tradables and non-tradables. What are the things that you can put into a box and send off to another country? That would be a tradable uh, versus the things that really require uh, physical presence um, in 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 order to in order to transact. That would be a non-tradable. And and the advent of digital uh, of digital um, digital technologies have really shifted those quite dramatically. In terms of the structure of production, one of the most dramatic uh, changes has been in the blurring of the line between what is labor and what is a micro and small medium enterprise. Um, so the, our earlier speaker spoke about how there is much more self-employment and how self-employment and entrepreneurship became an important part of people's response to the closures around COVID-19. Well, this blurring of this distinction between who is a worker and, what is, and, and who is a person who has their own business is become increasingly blurry. The distinction, it's, it's almost no longer a distinction so much as a continuum of uh, ways in which people can engage economically in markets. Um, there's also uh, uh, a, an increase in market power. And that's important to take into account in terms of you know, the, the vulnerability that people who are employed uh, might experience in terms of their negotiation position um, in, in the face of growing market power on the part of, of market dominating firms. Um, now, in terms of the space and time of work, this has been the change that probably has been most, most affected uh, by COVID-19. And this is where it's probably the way that the so-called tech acceleration, the acceleration of technology in, in the workspace, uh, this tech acceleration has become most evident to, uh, to, to working people. Where uh, the, the, the very definition of where work happens is up in the air, work can happen from anywhere. Um, the tyr tyranny of the clock is now dead. You know, it, it it doesn't matter so much as it used to uh, at what time work starts and at what time work finishes. So uh, the timing of work can be far more fluid. Um, the very definition of the work day and rush hour and what is a central business district of a city if people can rely on telepresence in order to do uh, many of the jobs that we used to do. Um, so all of that has really been accelerated by the pandemic and that's, uh, those are going to be deep changes that are going to be long lasting as business owners look at the cost of production and how this pandemic has forced them to really reconsider things like the rental of office space uh, and people to reconsider uh, whether it's worth paying high rents in order to live closer within walking distance to uh, CBD uh, and those sorts of considerations. In the midst of all this change, there are huge implications for labor policy skills policy and a, a colleague of mine also from the World Bank will be speaking on skills policy and education challenges specifically. Um, 
but there are huge implications for these areas of policy where uh, where governments have been active uh, for 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 decades. Um, three in particular are important: human capital and lifelong learning. And we heard from the previous speaker quite a bit about this, and we will hear uh, some more on on that specifically. So I won't address the uh, the, the the details on how. Um, uh, education policy is shifting. Social protection and labor policies, and this is my area of particular expertise, uh, things like employment protection, unemployment insurance, pensions, um, all of the uh, social protections and employment protections that workers uh, need in order to manage the risks in labor markets. And then revenue mobilization, that is taxation policy. Um, I'm sorry, I keep getting frozen. Ah, there we go. Um, so I won't speak on on education policy, as uh, my colleague will 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 speak to that uh, uh, with far greater expertise. But one of the things uh, when it comes to social protection and labor policy that these changes. Uh, the technological changes and the fluidity that has that digital uh, tools have brought to the workplace is that they have made work, the nature of work in uh, high income countries uh, look far uh, more like uh, the work in uh, low and middle income countries. So this is a, a scene from an, a market. A, a market. Um, the people who are working in this market are probably working informally, uh, which means that their work is probably uh, only lightly regulated, if regulated at all, and certainly probably not taxed. Um, they're exposed to greater risk. Uh, their work time, uh, the work rules, everything is very fluid. It has some definition. There is some institutions there, but these institutions are probably on the whole informal. Um, work in the high income countries with things like TaskRabbit and Uber and other digital platforms uh, providing personal services is starting to look a lot like the way work has always looked in low and middle income countries. And that has implications for uh, social protection and labor policy in the high income countries where these changes are being felt, but also for the middle income countries and low income countries um, where these, uh, these systems are, are developing, where they're fairly new. What you see here is a uh, chart uh, that tries to illustrate the poor fit between social protection and labor policies as they were written for a labor force in the 1950s and 1960s, which was mainly consisting of people in regular stable forms of employment in factories and firms, and, uh, and the reality of work now, which is becoming far more fluid and uh, informal in the ways that I described earlier. And what you see here is the share of the population that is contributing on a regular basis to social insurance in two periods of time. So the markers around the horizontal dotted line show the extent to which over 20 to 25 years, there's been change in this share of the labor force that's able to regularly participate in social security. And what you see immediately is that there's very, very little change. Um, and so over long periods of time, we don't see a lot of change there. And that to us is evidence that these institutions of social insurance and labor market, uh, labor market regulation really haven't kept up with changes in the labor market and certainly uh, were probably never appropriate in many other countries um, where, uh, where we see them today. The arguments that we make is that uh, many of the institutions, I mean, and we'll, I'm speaking here about uh, social insurance and, and, and labor markets, but I think that this applies to um, um, more broadly to, to many policy institutions that the assumptions on which the institutions were built need to change. With specific reference to social protection and labor markets, we have these industrial era assumptions about the nature of work, uh, the homogeneity of work. Everybody's working in regular uh, full-time jobs in factories and firms. These jobs are very, very stable. Work is, is, is a stable thing with long working employment relationships on which you can build uh, and deliver 
uh, social protection. Uh, intermediation, there's always an employer that is an intermediary between the state and its policy objectives and the people, the citizen who needs uh, work um, and protection. Um, that payroll is the most visible flow in the economy and therefore it is the most reliable flow that we should be taxing in order to finance um, the social protection and other public services like education and, and health. Our argument is that these assumptions have to change in order to match the way that work is today and is probably going to be in the future. Uh, so from homo homogeneity to diversity, people will work in lots of different ways. From stability to fluidity, you will probably change uh, your jobs many times throughout your working life. And certainly you may work in lots of different ways, sometimes at the same time. You can have a small business and have uh, a, an, employed, uh, an employed job with someone. Um, instead of inter intermediation, that there will be much more direct relationships between the state and, um, and citizens through a more government direct to people, largely through digital means, um, specifically uh, communication and flow of benefits, flow of taxes, mainly facilitated through digital means. And that consumption rather than payroll is probably going to be the more the most visible observable economic flow and therefore a far more reliable source of uh, tax income uh, in order to finance uh, social policy. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster because we are um, um, I'm running out of time. Um, now what this this assumes is a more inclusive social policy and a more inclusive and protective um, a social protection stance on the part of the state that tries to help people and give them the income support and the services that they need to navigate between uh, the various different jobs that they will likely to hold uh, during their the course of their working life. Um, We've done some very, very back of the envelope calculations to show how expensive the most inclusive uh, forms of, of social protection can be, sometimes out of the reach of many countries. However, there's lots of different ways in which one can bring these costs down um, in order to make them far more affordable. The, the point is, is that Whereas before it was okay to organize protection through the workplace and the place of employment, in the new world of work that we're seeing, there is going to be far greater fluidity. And so much greater effort should be put on uh, supporting people as they navigate the changes um, uh, as they go from one job to the next in one form of working to the next, rather than trying to protect them and to tie forms of protection strictly to where and how people work. That of course is going to imply having far greater tax revenue than many countries are able to collect right now. And what you see here is uh, a comparison of how the the ability of countries of different level of income to, uh, to collect taxes, tax revenue as a share of GDP um, has been changing, but there are still huge gaps between what is being collected by low and middle income countries and what they would need to collect in order to really uh, finance a, an effective social contract that matches the challenges of this new world of work. Um, to close that uh, revenue gap, it requires a lot of effort on taxation reforms. Uh, first and foremost, good housekeeping and the employ of greater technology in order to do better management, fiscal management and better uh, collection of taxes. The modernization of basic concepts we spoke before about, about these new dominant digital firms existing mainly in the cloud. Um, where they exist, what jurisdiction they fall under is a big challenge in order to, uh, to know how they should be fairly and appropriately taxed. Um, the rebalance in the use of tax instruments, sometimes a taxation of, uh, of property um, is not as intensively conducted by governments and instead uh, there is greater taxation of labor, which can uh, in many ways punish uh, the creation of jobs. Um, and then the deployment of new tax in, uh, instruments, uh, for example, taxation of uh, carbon and other uh, pollutants far more intensively. Um, the, the point is, is that there are ways uh, within reach to uh, close this gap and it will be 
really necessary uh, to close this gap in order for governments to really offer the sort of uh, social contract uh, risk uh, management uh, uh, services that people will need in this new world of work. This is where I'll end and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Packard. Another very, very interesting presentation. And I have our first question. And at this point, I'm going to ask I'm going to allow Prof. Ying to unmute himself and ask his question. Prof. Ying? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Dr. Packard, very interesting presentation. I actually have two questions for you, but let me start with the first one. The first question really is, um, considering Jamaica as a small island development state, how do we balance between the value added based on automation with job losses, poverty alleviation, and the digital warfare between leading economies such as the USA and China? Um. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I've, I worked on several small island states. Um, I used to be part of the World Bank's program in the South Pacific. Um, so we had clients like the Solomon Islands and um, Vanuatu and places that uh, aren't dissimilar from Jamaica and uh, facing uh, similar challenges. Um, I, I think that one of the things that it, being very clear about what uh, what Jamaica's assets are. Uh, one of those assets is, is huge. It's um, um, a, a deep-rooted familiarity, or the, you know, the, the the fact that it's an English-speaking country and an English-speaking population um, is a huge asset, and and that already gives um, students from Jamaica a, a a a a a huge head start in the global. Um, the, in the global uh, workplace. Uh, the workplace of technology is an English speaking workplace. Um, and of course, people can, um, can uh, learn that skill. Uh, however, you know, it makes all the difference if you grew up with that skill um, already. So I think that that's, that's an important asset. I think that uh, the, you know, the, what, when the previous spe speaker spoke about two things specifically, the uh, enabling of um, self-employment through digital platforms. Uh, and that's particularly important for uh, small island state economies and working people in, who live in small island states, because what the digital technologies do is they help to um, defeat or overcome the tyranny of distance. And they also, they, they help you overcome the, um, the, 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 they say the, the curse of smallness, if you will. Um, through digital technologies, an entrepreneur in uh, Jamaica can access a far bigger uh, potential pool of customers um, than would ever have been possible before. So uh, a, a, an entrepreneurial idea the same idea as a, a, a one held by, by a similarly entrepreneurial person in a place like the United States. In Jamaica, prior to the advent of digital technologies and digital marketplaces, um, the Jamaican entrepreneur would have been constrained by two factors, distance and small potential markets. Digital tools allow uh, the, the Jamaican entrepreneur to overcome both of those things. And that is really revolutionary. The other thing is that it allows you to erase this distinction that I spoke about before between tradables and non-tradables. So now uh, service providers in Jamaica uh, who might have been limited, and this is where English comes in uh, as, as very, very important, who might've been limited uh, by having to give 
personal services in person, through telepresence, they're able to, to reach out and provide those services to a much broader uh, uh, potential set of clients. You haven't really touched the question about the, the trade war with respect to technology, because that affects us. You know, if we want to go 5G or 6G, um, you have the United States saying one thing. Uh, so you have the political uh, aspect of it, which I know you are trying to avoid. But the reality is that when there is warfare among countries like China and, uh, and the USA, as is going on now with 5G and all those things and Huawei and all that, it restricts the advanced technology that we can use to capitalize on those opportunities. Yes, sir. Uh, that's very, very true. Um, I think when, when giants fight, it's the, the small people who always suffer. That's, uh, that's a sort of a, a version of a saying that we used to have. Um, but I think that, that has, it, it's very, very true. I don't want to minimize it, but I would also venture that this has always been the case. Um, and, and so, you know, one, one does one's best and, and we try to work through uh, things like or, uh, multinational organizations to uh, bring people into a system of rules where size uh, shouldn't matter as much as it has in the past. The final question for me is, um, what is going to be the change in role of trade unions, employers and government? with respect to social protection in this kind of market? I'm glad that you asked that because um, I think that despite the fall in union membership um, around the world, uh, I, I think that union membership is going to be even more important than it was in the past in order to ensure uh, good employment outcomes and the fair remuneration of people's human capital. I say that because um, market power on the side of employers has grown tremendously. Uh, when I talked about the dominance of these digital companies, the, um, uh, the power that is gained by these large companies that gain scale without mass, um, uh, we, there, there is evidence that um, markets are becoming uh, less fair for ordinary working people. Um, and, and because of this shift in market power and unfair exploitative market practices, I think the accountability mechanism offered by unions is more vital than ever. But it's not unions as uh, we knew them back in the 1950s and the 1960s. It's far more uh, like cooperatives that are providing not only voice, but services to a number of uh, small self-employed people. Uh, I mean, that would be the extreme manifestation, but um, that is kind of the, the, the future of, um, of organizations that are going to be effective in the workplace in the accountability function. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Packard and Prof. Ying. We have a few questions in the chat. And let me see how quickly we can get through them because we have two presenters who will have to leave soon. So the first question um, from Veronica, she's asking, what are some strategies that Jamaica can implement to assist the growth of employment in this pandemic? Um, why don't you give, and give me the other one too uh, and we can save time because- Okay. Um, we also have a question here from Mr. Ora Lawson, and he says, do you have any suggestions? Um, okay, any suggestions to address the rigidity in regulations that exist in many sectors during this time in the Caribbean region? Okay. Maybe we'll um, take the other two after. <laughs> thank you. Um, that, uh, having both at the same time is actually helpful because they're very, very related. Um, one of the things that, that is an observation, and I think this is true in almost every country that I've, that I've worked on, is that the regulations are, uh, struggle to keep up um, with the reality of uh, the, working, the, the working world economies. You know, economies, labor markets, markets, these are organic constructs. And so they're constantly shifting because we as human beings are constantly shifting. Um, and 
those shifts, particularly of late because of technology, they've gone, they've been accelerated and it's very difficult for laws and regulations to keep up. Now that's relevant to um, Veronica's question because one of the things that is, is uh, almost uh, an imperative right now is for there to be um, the legality and the regulation of telepresence. You know, telepresence is something that is now a must. Before it was a convenience, it was a luxury for many people. Now it's an imperative for the workplace. How, you know, if countries don't keep up with that, um, then it's very, very difficult for people to create legal jobs. And so then we have a greater uh, size of informal jobs, which has its own, uh, their own problems that that, that, that would bring about. Um, how to make regulation more flexible is to focus on, on the most important things, the most important risks, and to put effort on making sure that regulation is still relevant for those risks. For example, uh, forced labor, exploitation, um, working hours. Um, those are the things that we really want to focus on uh, instead of trying to focus on everything. Um, and that way one can be more agile, more, more nimble and, uh, and to keep up. It's still very, very difficult to do because it's, it's fraught with political controversy and problems, but at least if you focus on the things that are most important, the risks that are, are, are the ones that people care about the most, um, it gives you a more, uh, a, a more limited things to, 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 uh, to worry about and to spend time on and then you can possibly keep up. Okay, and quickly, uh, well, I have to quickly go through the last two. Um, somebody asks, they would want a perspective on the creative industries as well as the care economy in light of tech celebration are, as these are culture specific. Um, yes, and they are also both, I mean, this is where uh, the, the cultural specificity um, actually helps to maintain those employment possibilities close to where the demand exists. So, you know, we just spoke about uh, how technology helps you to overcome the tyranny of distance and the importance of business process um, uh, outsourcing as a job creation uh, uh, opportunity. Things that are culturally specific um, have to be done uh, close to where the demand is. And so in many ways that can, those things that are culturally specific and tourism is also a good example, um, can only be done by people from that place, done well by people from that place. And in many ways, that's a blessing because it does allow you to, um, to maintain those as viable job uh, opportunities for the people of, of a particular country. Okay, um, all right, um, Dr. Packard, I have a number of questions in the chat, but I don't think we can get through them. I don't, because there are other persons who need to leave and so we have to move on. However, if you don't mind and you do have the time to spend with us a little longer, and if you want to reply to those questions, maybe in the chat so that other persons can see. So if you're not in a hurry, then we have at least three questions from Karina, Carleen, and also Alan in the chat, if you don't mind. Um, I'd also invite persons to look in the chat. So links have been sent to three publications by Dr. Packard that you can access to get further information. So now we're going to move on. And, but before we do, the, the first thing we will have is the poll. What are your thoughts on this session? Again, just like the first one, you will read the session. Excellent, very good. Poor, very poor, whichever. And the poll will be coming up on your screens about now. So we will quickly do the vote so that we can move forward. Okay, the poll will be up for another 15 seconds. Okay. 
Okay. And that is it. So we'll end the poll now. And the results. So we have 89% of persons who voted um, rating the presentation as very good or excellent. Thank you again, everyone. Now, we will firstly let me announce that the winner of the first prize, the first question, is Miss Andrea, Mrs. Andrea Newman Stapleton. And she was the one who answered correctly the question from on Kimika's presentation. And here's a picture of the token you will receive from us, Miss. Mrs. Newman Stapleton, so you will just put your email contacts in the list. You will send it to Roxine Ricketts, and she will contact you as to how we can get your token to you. And thank you very much. Now, we also have a question that is based on Dr. Packard's presentation. And in his presentation, Dr. Packard identified three areas for government policy action. And the first person to tell me one of those three areas will get this prize. So again, um, send your response in the chat. And that's the token that you will win if you answer correctly. OK, so now we will move along quickly because our next presenter has, not, has very little time. Our next presenter is Dr. Rita Almeida. Rita Almeida is a lead economist in the World Bank Group and is currently serving as Human Development Program Leader for Central America, and that includes Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. In this position, Dr. Almeida oversees the Human Development Program across the six countries. Since joining the World Bank in 2002, she has held different positions, including senior economist, in the education and in the social protection and jobs global practices, and economists in the development economics research group. During this tenure, she served as the bank's skills global lead and managed lending and analytical work across Latin America and the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa. Most recently, she served as practice manager for the Latin America and Caribbean region, leading a team of more than 30 professionals. Rita is a leading expert in education policies, labor market analysis, training, and lifelong learning policies, labor market regulations, social protection for workers, firm productivity and innovation policies, public expenditure, public expenditure reviews, and in the evaluation of social programs. Over the years, Dr. Almeida has authored several World Bank flagship publications. Her work, has been, her work has been covered in the media, and her research has been featured in leading world economic reports. Her academic work has been published in a variety of top general interest and specialized journals, including the Economic Journal, the American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, Journal of International Economics, German, Journal of Development Economics, Labor Economics, and the world development. Prior to joining the World Bank Group, she served as economist in a private investment bank and as lecturer at the Portuguese Catholic University in Lisbon, a Portuguese national. She earned her PhD in economics from Universitat Pompei Fabra in Spain and a bachelor's degree in economics from Portuguese Catholic University. She is a fellow and she's also a fellow of the Institute for the Study of Labor since 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like, to, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Rita Almeida, who will be speaking on rethinking education and training in a changing global environment. Dr. Almeida, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richards, for your very kind introduction. Can you hear me? You can. I can. I can. Thank you so much. That's a very kind. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Um, it, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to join the workshop. And, and I thank the Planning Institute and, and in particular, uh, Dr. Daindra Coy for the invitation. 
Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it's, it's going to be smooth. Um, could you so kindly confirm um, that you can see the yes, presentation? Yes, you yes, can? Yes. Okay, yes. terrific. So, um, I, and I also wanted to let the organizers know that I've, I've rearranged my commitment. So I will be able to stay for the presentation so that the organizers uh, know that. Uh, so thank you again. I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it was great to, to hear the presentation for Dr. Faircloth and also, uh, uh, follow my colleague Truman Parker's presentation. And like he said, I'm going to zoom in uh, quite directly into this unique opportunity that I deeply believe that we are living today of rethinking education and, and skills policies. And, and for, it's, a very, it's a, a very unfortunate crisis, but I, I truly believe that, that uh, it's bringing us very good opportunities. My presentation is going to be um, separated into three big uh, buckets. Uh, I'm going to start briefly uh, by discussing skills. Skills for what? Why do we care? Uh, which skills? Uh, when can we accumulate skills? Then I'm going to briefly motivate following what, what my colleague Truman Parker was already saying, that the challenge, the changes in the world of work are, are posing unique opportunities for us to rethink education uh, after, especially after COVID-19, which is accelerating even faster these big patterns of of automation, of using technology, of digital skills, and so on. And I'm going to end the presentation proposing a couple of, uh, we call them in the bank, guiding principles or principles to inspire public policy. So hopefully that's going to resonate with the audience. Um, so uh, very briefly, skills, it's a, a concept that everyone is talking about. Uh, these days, and I wanted to start reminding us all why do we need to focus on skills and why skills are important. And, um, uh, and skills are importantly essentially for, for three big uh, policy goals. One, because we want economies to become more productive. We want to support productivity growth. We want to foster economic transformation and that for that we need skills uh, for the economies. We need individuals to become more employable. We need more uh, good earning opportunities for individuals. And we want economies, individuals, the workforce to become more adaptable, faster and adjusted and also more resilient with more capacity to face shocks. And these goals are not independent from each other. They are mutually reinforcing. So um, we want skills and education policies to achieve these skills. But what does a person in the 21st century, a well-educated person really um, need? And here, I think it's never enough to go back to definitions because we hear so many concepts um, and I think um, it's important to reinforce that skills, uh, the, the skills of, of 21st century really encompass three different types or categories of skills. On one hand, the cognitive skills, and I think more and more important, we worry with building higher order cognitive things about higher order cognitive skills, which are basically related with our capacity of learning how to learn that gives us the lifetime adaptability. It's about our knowledge to solve problems. It's about our use of logical, intuitive and critical thinking above and beyond obviously having academic contexts about verbal ability or numeracy or, or, or memory recognition and so on. It's also very important to have some technical skills, and these are very important in specific occupation, uh, occupations. They are usually related with um, they are usually related with specific occupations or trades. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking about um, uh, specific tasks that deal with with manual dexterity, uh, use of methods, materials, tools. We could also include here some of the ICT um, skills, and then it's. It's a concept that it's also a lot debated these days, but I think it's 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 good also to reinforce that it encompasses different things, social emotional skills. And by this, I mean not only our capacity to self-regulate, our capacity to persevere, to have decision making, and also a range of interpersonal skills, such as the empathy or our capacity to collaborate and work with others. These above and beyond, obviously, certain personality traits that we also have and that 
may also may be uh, malleable over time, such as our beliefs or attitudes or motivation or openness to experience consciousness or extroversion to give you a couple of examples. So uh, in a nutshell, we should worry with, with, with this bucket of, 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 of different skills to be a well-educated individual. Uh, the other idea I wanted to reinforce uh, today in this forum is that the acquisition of skills, it's really a lifelong endeavor. And for many of us, when we look back, uh, by the time we left school, our skills and our competencies today are completely different. And more than um, uh, half of an individual's lifetime human capital, it's actually accumulated on the job. So um, I think these ideas are important, that skills is really a continuum. Skills beget skills. The, the better the foundational skills that we have early in life, the easier it's going to get to, to accumulate more skills over time. And I think this is exactly what this slide wanted to show you, that there's, there's a continuum. It starts very early, as early as when the baby is um, still with, uh, uh, you know, about uh, to be born. And it continues through our childhood. It continues during our youth and teenage years. And then uh, when we are in the labor market um, and, when, uh, and when we are uh, transitioning from school to work or in the labor market. And obviously there's many different policies that play a role uh, from early childhood development to basic and post-secondary education into short and long-term training policies. And I think Dr. Fairclot was also talking about the importance that today it is uh, related with retooling, retraining, reskilling. And these are all things that for many of us happens either when we are in the workplace or uh, when we are transitioning in between different states in the labor market. So many policies are relevant. And I think as important as this, many actors play and should have a role. For instance, when we accumulate skills um, during the first years of our lives, families are incredibly important to offer us the opportunity um, and to offer or to, to give us uh, the enabling environment and the stimulation that, baby need, that babies need. The same during our children in school years. Schools and families, TVET providers are incredibly important. And so are university and the employers themselves, especially when we focus um, on the accumulation of skills later in life. I think one of the main things that I wanted to, to leave in this presentation, it's the idea that um, automation, everything that Truman uh, Pockard uh, talked about, the, the, what can potentially be a threat, as, we, as we've seen in the automation, need not be a threat if individuals are actually well prepared to upgrade their skills and to benefit from technology and not being replaced by technology. And I think uh, the WDR that, that, um, that uh, Truman mentioned from 2018 uh, laid this out incredibly well and they show with different pieces of evidence that skills that complement technology are increasingly human higher order cognitive things, uh, thinking. Uh, so exactly this capacity of learning how to learn has opposite to uh, having specific uh, subject content or social emotional skills. Like I was saying, uh, uh, the interpersonal skills, the empathy, our capacity to work with others, and also the skills that are immediately related with the use of technology, such as digital literacy, are also becoming quite important. And, and, and the bank in different reports has shown the empirical evidence on, on these patterns in emerging economies. Uh, yet, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we do face quite a few challenges. And um, all, these, all these pressures and all these big trends that are happening and now with COVID-19 are, are, are really uh, cutting the region in a, complete, in a, in a, in a vulnerable situation. Uh, in these graphs, you actually show the incidence of learning poverty. And I think this is an important statistic that I wanted to draw your attention. Today in Latin America and the Caribbean, 51% of the children cannot read with proficiency by the age of 10. 
So in other words, children who are supposed to, to, to have uh, capacity to read and understand a very, very simple text, they don't have that ability. And if we look within countries, across any country, ranging from Chile, Costa Rica, um, or going all the way perhaps to um, more vulnerable economies, such as, for instance, Nicaragua, where I work with, um, there are huge gaps between the capacities that children ha have in the upper uh, quintiles of the income distribution versus the, low at, uh, the lowest quintiles. And in the middle of all this, because this data actually refers to pre-COVID trends, uh, in the middle of this, we were faced with COVID-19 pandemics, and we had nationwide school closures. Um, and you can see those school closures um, on the left of the screen in the, in the big map. And certainly in Latin America, it may, most of the countries had countrywide closures, and families were quite still uh, poorly re equipped to, um, to face remote learning opportunities. And we see here that only 50% of individuals in Latin America actually have access and can use internet uh, in their homes. This created huge difficulties for ministries of education, uh, for technical institutions to deliver training and to deliver education in such a difficult Contacts. So our big attention, especially uh, certainly at the bank, but much broader than that, is is with learning losses, with the risk of school dropouts, which uh, are incredibly important risks, adding to an already very large share of youth inactivity, what we call minis, youth that's either not working or studying. And Latin America already has a very important tradition of having a very significant share of youth um, not being in school and, and, not, and not working. So uh, I started this talk saying that I believe there's a unique opportunity to uh, rethink education and, 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 and training systems and, and to build back better, to build back better systems. So after the initial phases of the coping and the continuity of, of, of education and training services that all the countries in the world have have uh, coped with this huge challenge. Um, I think there's going to be an opportunity to focus on more accelerated learning patterns. And we should keep our eyes on what's the long-term vision, which is an increased access to equitable, quality and resilient systems. And for this, there are obvious things that need to be done, like closing the digital divide that's going to be more and more important. We also need to worry much more with the system as a whole. And by this, I mean tackling inequalities outside the school system, also at home, because children are not only uh, children, when they get to school, they are, they are already the result to a large extent of what they, what they leave in their own um, home environment. So it's very important for this coordination between school and home. And it's very important at a time of huge fiscal pressures everywhere to safeguard public education spending and also ensure um, support to, 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 uh, to the education system, to the management of education system. And this slide is supposed to, it, it's actually, a, the World Bank just launched a new publication where we are um, uh, proposing a vision for the learning of the 21st century, the learning of the future. And I'm presenting here uh, what I think it's the, the summary slide that talks about um, the vision um, for, for, for this education system. And in a nutshell, we say uh, we want to build education systems that where learning happens with joy, with purpose, with rigor for everyone and everywhere. It's obviously ambitious, but I think our vision should be ambitious because then we can worry with implementation and how to get there. Uh, but for this to happen, we need to think about different pillars. Um, we need to think on how uh, that learners need to be prepared and need to be motivated to learn when they get to schools. 
Teachers uh, need to be effective at all levels. And most importantly, uh, they need to be valued. That's something that's very, very important to continue working in LAC. There's a lot in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there's a lot of work to be done there. We need to have classrooms that are a learning space uh, it, 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 with, with a curriculum that is it's, it's a tool to, to be customized and to be adapted to, to depending on, on the concepts that are more important um, for different age ranges that classroom tools for each student um, are available to teach at the right level for the different children and that learning resources in school and at home are available. We also want schools that are safe places and inclusive by this we mean free of violence, accessible for children with disabilities that are resilient to uh, infrastructure, to, to, to risks, um, including natural risks. And, and last but not the least, I think we want increasingly to reinforce the idea that education systems need to be well managed. This at scale, um, at the, and the ministries of education have an important role to play, but also at the school level, principals, uh, need to hit, to have uh, important um, skill uh, professional development opportunities. They need to be accountable. They need to have a, a solid career path. Um, and we need we need high quality bureaucracies for for sustainable uh, reforms. Last but not the least, I think technology cuts across all these pillars, um, and it's really a channel a vehicle for us that's now much more important than, than before. And I think my, my previous uh, colleagues reinforced that idea. It's really changing dramatically the way that we are delivering these services, but it's really important to keep the focus on what we want to influence. And ultimately, we want children to learn with joy, with purpose and with rigor. And technology should be a tool to empower, to empower that focus on learning. Um, uh, in this slide, I'm going to leave you with uh, three, five proposals that we think are could be inspiring for public policy. Um, and the first one is related with technology. I think we need to think of of, of technology, invest smartly in technology. And by mean by this, I mean that technology should be seen as a mean to achieve something. Technology in itself. Uh, doesn't necessarily have uh, uh, a purpose. We need to think of an ultimate goal of the accumulation of learning, accumulation of human capital, and the, the, human, the human development outcome that we want to achieve. And in education, it can be very powerful to empower teachers, to personalize learners, to connect learners everywhere, and, and, and also to help manage the system in a more open, interoperable, and transparent way. The second idea is that more and more we need to be guided by results, by evidence. And um, so having evidence-based policy and having the, uh, the, the capacity within Ministry of Education um, uh, to uh, collect data, to analyze data and analyze evidence and make this information available and influencing policy making, it's incredibly important. Uh, our goal should be focused on inclusion, on equity, uh, as I said, ensuring financial commitment that it's commensurable with these ambitious uh, goals. And last but not the least, I think pursuing systemic reforms um, with a broad political commitment uh, for sustainable learning impacts. We know that we need um, very sustainable reforms, years and years of reforms that have very clear uh, and well aligned objectives are very important to achieve results in education. Uh, now I, I'm going to uh, uh, talk very briefly about uh, building adaptive education and training policies. Um, uh, I think Dr. Fairclot put a lot of emphasis on the importance of the technologies presenting, especially after COVID, of building and upscaling um, uh, new skills or different skills, not necessarily for sectors that we know today. So it's also very important to think how technical education and training things, uh, systems can become more modern, more, adapt, uh, more adapt, adaptive. 
And, in, uh, and here I'm proposing uh, five principles. The first one uh, has to do with being ruthless market-driven. Um, uh, being ruthless, market-driven, or demand-driven. So really putting employers in the driver's seat. By this, I mean that technical education and training policies really needs to find ways, both at a macro level and at a more micro level, to be aligned and producing the skills, the competencies for the occupations that are needed in the labor market today and also in the future. And this has the, the operational implications of this are, are very different, but it, they can go from having um, uh, regional skills councils where we have this opportunity for conversation at the more macro level, or it can, or it can be related with uh, the capacity of the private sector to be engaged in the definition of the curricula of technical education and training courses, or even um, being um, training uh, TVET teachers, for instance, so that they are equipped with the latest skills, the latest knowledge that of, of technology that is being used in the workplace. Um, the second principle has to do with tailoring the needs of the clientele and the population. There won't be a one size fits all. There's different groups that require different um, interventions. And I think public policy should recognize this diversity. For one group, there, there may be need to remedial foundational skills um, and training packages should have that component. Age or gender sensitive training delivery may be also very important, especially for certain groups. Um, and certainly um, we need to think of a very flexible pathway for the acquisition of skills, allowing this horizontal permeability and avoiding at all cost um, dead ends in technical education and training systems so that there's not a negative stigma um, in these systems. Adopt more task-based approaches to training as opposite to um, uh, occupational, um, a focus on occupations or in degrees. And this should really cut across the curricula, the definition of standards, the assessment, the evaluation, or even the training of the instructors. I think more and more we also see that, especially to train adults, we need uh, active learning practices. We need a much more, more blurred line between classroom and workplace learning. Um, and this obviously requires the involvement and the participation of the private sector. Training programs that are more effective are the ones who combine moments of classroom learning, more theoretical learning with moments of, of workplace-based learning. In these, in these moments, uh, many training uh, uh, institutes are, are actually turning to work uh, environment and to simulate uh, simulations exactly because the, the 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 training at work it's not possible because of COVID-19 and last but not the least uh, again the focus on results being evidence-based being data-driven and using this information of the effectiveness of courses to to um, to adapt and to adjust their learning uh, competencies. And here, I think it's very important to emphasize that there's a lot of labor market intelligence, a lot of information on the labor market returns of short-term training courses that can and should be more available to children and to their families at the time of where they're making critical decisions of, of, of uh, which route to take. So I think this is an important area for um, further investments and, and further um, uh, thinking. Uh, and this is going to be my last slide. I'm not sure if I'm uh, um, already over time, uh, but, but I'm just going to finish with this last idea. Um, which, which is, is essentially emphasizing that uh, skills policy priorities in the fast changing world should not only be a responsibility of the public sector. The public sector has an important role to play in terms of ensuring the readiness, the incentives, that incentives are, are aligned for this investment. It's very important to have a public sector that nurtures cooperation, commitment, coordination across the different stakeholders' involvement. But there's surely a very important role to play to the private sector 
uh, because they are going to benefit also tremendously to having a more trained and better equipped uh, workforce. So um, there's a call to actively engage national, uh, the private sector in, in the social dialogue to prioritize skills development. And last but not the least, I think families. Families have the opportunity to engage with children from their first days um, at home and also in school. So it's very, very important to nurture the participation of families, the participation of, of uh, um, communities all the way through all the different phases of human capital policies from childhood care to uh, primary and secondary education, stimulation in parenting programs, uh, and throughout post-secondary or even universities. They can be very, very important um, uh, for the accountability of service delivery. And I finish my presentation here. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Almeida. I know at the start of your presentation, you said you had managed to shift your schedule around a bit so you can spend some more time with us. Okay. That's, that's well, correct. In, well, in that that's case, correct. I am craving your indulgence. Um, our next presenter, he has to be somewhere in a few in a few minutes, in a little in a little under an hour. And so I have a number of questions for you. And because of what you presented on it would have triggered a lot of discussions. So even some questions that came from the first presentation, then you could help to shed some light on. So I am requesting your permission to hold the discussion part of your presentation for a few minutes so that we could allow the other person who has a serious time constraint to go ahead and then we can pick up with your discussion point after. Is that okay with you? That's fine, that's fine. I can stay for the next 30 minutes. So that's not a problem. 30 minutes. Mm. Well, no, I think I might need more than 30. So in that case, let us quickly go through your questions. I'm gonna need a little bit more than 30. So I'll just quickly go through your questions then. All right, so the questions that we have. Um, so Prof Ying has some questions here. And the first question he has states, uh, let me read. What are the adaptive education strategies for enabling leaders in the public and private sector to be fit for purpose in the workplace of the future? So what are the adaptive education strategies for enabling leaders in the public and private sector to be fit for purpose in the workplace of the future? Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I think the question is hinting to two important things. One is hinting to uh, the, the competencies that the public sector leaders, uh, the, the public bureaucracy should have uh, in order to, to shape and nurture uh, edu education and training policies that are adaptive and flexible. And here I think um, we do need to have, I think one issue has to do with political influence. We need more and more uh, bureaucracies that uh, are technically strong, that are evidence-based, that use data, that use evidence and detach um, the political influence for many, many uh, uh, bureaucracies um, in different ministries, but particularly in human capital uh, related ones. Um, to, to really emphasize the technical competencies and create good uh, opportunities and good career development uh, systems that can nurture that, that talent. So I think that's a, a very important uh, for public policy. Uh, and by this, I think there's one specific role uh, that I think it's going to play in the future on data. More and more, we have the capacity to collect data either on beneficiaries, on the quality of service delivery, in the case of training policies, on the transition uh, of the beneficiaries to the labor markets. So I think having the capacity and having um, in, within these ministries to collect this data, to analyze this data, and ultimately to use it so that you really have a full, uh, a, a full feedback loop in place, it's incredibly important. So I think 
These are issues that one way or the other, education and training systems need to be nurturing. Uh, I know that, for instance, many ministries of education at all across Latin America have been investing, they naturally start with small units, but in labs, that are really laboratories to test new policies. It's very, it's important often to, when we want to change a certain incentive or we want where, where we want to uh, uh, think outside the box and uh, think of, for example, on how to develop a certain partnership with a private sector in a particular training. Um, it's, uh, we can start with a small pilot, have a small evaluation and then take it to scale. So I think that's an idea uh, also for others uh, to consider. Um, the other, um, the other uh, side of the question I think was asking to reflect a little bit on how can we incentivize the collaboration of the private sector. Uh, and this is the question of, of, of the million. I think this is a very good question. Uh, we need to create incentives for this to happen. Um, I think bigger firms are naturally more prone to think about on the job training because they have the capacity to do it. Um, uh, and, and often they are already investing very important amounts in, in the skills and, uh, and, and the training of their own workforce. Public policy probably has a bigger role to nurture and to coordinate uh, smaller employers. Uh, so there's different ways that countries have dealt with national training funds, for instance, but I think um, uh, thinking of schemes that nurture that coordination, putting, um, promoting that conversation, especially ab among smaller and medium sized firms about the importance of training, um, even sensibilization campaigns, because often the employers and the firm owners are not aware of the impacts that training and workforce development has on their own productivity, on technology adoption. So there's, there's a very important role to play for, for um, public policy in that coordination. Back okay. to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Almeida. We have one more question. How can families nurture skills development in a global pandemic where many parents are off to work? Um, that's, that's also another good, uh, good question. I think, uh, well, families, uh, families have the children for most of the time. They shape personalities, they shape aspirations, uh, they shape so many different things um, when children are not in school. So I think all those need to be perceived as opportunities to stimulate, opportunities for parent-child connection. And that's incredibly important. Children, uh, I'm not an ECD specialist, but I know that the link beyond the physical, you know, the, the everything that's related with the physical well-being, the nutrition uh, and avoiding uh, malnutrition and ensuring that children have adequate health care and so on. Uh, I think there's a lot of role to play for families and for parents in, in shaping the readiness of the children to learn. And this can happen, doesn't necessarily need to be uh, during the whole day. I think it's a lot about the importance and the quality of the interaction, the parent and the child interaction. But one thing is for sure, I think public policy has a role to play in working with parents. We need much more parenting programs. And I know that Jamaica has an outstanding example um, that has inspired many other programs in, throughout the world. Parents also need training and need awareness and need information, mothers, caregivers, that they have that capacity and that they have the capacity to influence cognitive foundational skills and also social and emotional skills. Okay, Over. thank you. Okay, so I am just gonna take two more questions quickly since we need to wrap up. Um, the first, the, second, the third question is, what steps can be taken to promote greater child friendliness in schools in Latin America and the Caribbean? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I was with my microphone uh, muted. 
um, the, the question was about the friendliness of, of the- um, How of can schools. we promote, yes, child friendliness in schools? Well, uh, well I'm, I'm happy when I share my presentation, I'm happy. We actually have, the World Bank had just launched a, a very thorough report that talks in depth about these different pillars. But I think uh, one thing I wanted to reinforce today, that's the importance of safe and inclusive spaces. Um, I think it's very important to talk about spaces that are free of violence. Again, schools has an opportunity for learning to happen with joy, with purpose. They cannot be places with violence. So it's very important to, um, to ring fence schools so that they can uh, work that way. I think they increasingly need to be spaces that are um, um, uh, friendly to people uh, with disabilities where learning can happen for everyone, not only for specific groups or, or people with a specific culture, that infrastructure is resilient. And I think specifically in the Caribbean, the, the resilience to climate change, the resilience to natural shocks, it's extremely important. And that's that's a whole line of work that the World Bank has um, on, on, uh, on when we provide support to countries that promoting this, this resilience in infrastructure. And I think in terms of curricular um, content, prioritizing learning um, in the mother tongue, we know that learning, especially in the first years, is incredibly more effective if it's offered in, in mother tongue. And unfortunately, in many countries in the regions, this is not yet uh, the case, but I think these are are important um, are important ideas. Over. Okay, okay, Dr. Almeida, there are some more questions in the chat, but we can't take them now. So I'm going to request from you the same thing that I did from Dr. Packard, which is if you could respond to the persons in the chat or respond to everyone, because I think there are other persons in the meeting who would love the responses to those questions so that we can at least see your responses to those questions. So Absolutely. thank you again very thank much. You again. Thank you, thank so you again for the invitation. Okay, you're welcome. And so at this point, we will now go again to our quick poll. How do you rate this session? So the poll will be coming up on your screen in a moment. Again, lock in your votes. Excellent, very good. Average, poor. So. And as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Okay, and any more votes? I think that's it. We'll be closing it in another five seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and now we are, we're going to have our price question again. But before we do, I would like to congratulate the winner of the second prize question, Mr. Alan Campbell. And he won for himself a nice token on behalf of us at the PIOG. And now we will have our third, our, our question on the third presentation, right? So, right, so that is, that is what Mr. Campbell has won. Beautiful. And now we will have the question. And here you can see the question on your street, on your screen. It says, what three skills are needed to be a well-educated person in the 21st century? So I hope you remember the three skills that Dr. Almeida had said. Please put your responses in the chat and we will inform you of the winners later. Okay, thank you. And now we will move on to our next presenter. And our next presenter is Mr. Donald Danny Roberts. So Donald Danny Roberts, CDJP, is a senior lecturer and head of the Hugh Sherrill Labor Institute at the Consortium for Social Development and Research at the open campus of the University of the West Indies. A ACP EEC scholar, Mr. Roberts is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a bachelor's in communications with social sciences 
and a Master of Philosophy in Government. He was awarded the Order of Distinction Commander Class in 2009 for his contribution to the trade union movement and was appointed a Justice of the Peace for St. Andrew in 2021. In 2011, sorry. He recently served as co-chairman of the Public Sector Transformation Committee, which oversaw the successful implementation of critical benchmarks under the Government of Jamaica's IMF program. Mr. Roberts has published a number of scholarly articles and book chapters on industrial relations, trade unionism, and broader labor market issues. He is the co-editor of A Roadmap for Trade Unions, Relevance and Sustainability. He has made presentations locally and regionally on various aspects of labor market studies for managers and workers in both the public and private sector. He has also lectured a number of courses on industrial relations and other labor issues. A former vice president of the National Workers Union and the Jamaica Confederate of Trade Unions, Mr. Roberts has presided over several disciplinary hearings in both the public and private sectors. He has also been a member of a number of committees and, board, and boards, including the Minimum Wage Advisory Commission, the Labor Market Advisory Committee, the National Housing Trust Board, the Board of the Development Bank of Jamaica, and the Heart Trust NTA Board, to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, today, Mr. Roberts will be speaking on Jamaica, Jamaican labor laws, are they fit for purpose? And please join me in welcoming Mr. Danny Roberts. Mr. Roberts, over to you. Thank you very much. Do I have control of my co-hosting privilege? That... Yes, you should. Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah, so nothing is moving. Oh, that's beginning to move now. All right, so thank you very much. All right, so my presentation this morning will be focusing on the Jamaica's labor law, fit for purpose, but obviously within the context of a post-COVID response. I begin with a, an acknowledgement that the world of work certainly has been severely impacted by this uh, global pandemic. Not only in terms of public health, which uh, we recognize is, is very crucial for, for economic development and growth, but also in terms of the economic and social disruption, which obviously has threatened the lives of, of millions of persons worldwide. And one of the things that is quite obvious is that global crises seem always to have its greatest impact on labor market. For example, in 2008, the global financial meltdown, which had absolutely nothing to do with the labor market, had its most devastating impact on the labor market. So what has been the impact of this COVID uh, pandemic and how much has it affected labor markets? There are some obvious global consequences, job losses, bankruptcy of small businesses, decline in real wages. And what therefore the objective of any exercise in a post-COVID recovery period has to do, particularly at this time, is first of all, to ensure that the workforce, the citizens, the population remain safe. And secondly, to ensure that businesses and jobs continue to be sustained. Now, it is estimated that the impact of this pandemic may result in somewhere in the region of $305 million, $305 million job losses um, for, for, for the 2020 period. Um, that's the global figures. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimate that the GDP is going to be declined uh, overall by about 9.1%, which would make it the worst in recent history. Job losses in Latin America and the Caribbean is estimated to be going to be somewhere around 30 million jobs. And most of these jobs are going to be lost, but are going to have a difficulty in, in, re, re, in, in, in having us get these jobs back on board quickly, the recovery process for two reasons. 
One is the limited opportunity for the immediate integration into the workforce because of the nature of the Jamaican economy. And secondly, is obviously the restriction on the movement of persons seeking employment. And, and as we shall see later, many of the jobs um, in Jamaica depend upon the social interaction. And so there's a challenge to that. And therefore the real impact, um, as we have seen in the second quarter of 2020, is that our unemployment is somewhere about 11% arising from COVID. Now, Jamaica um, has seen the, the fallout more specifically. Um, Professor Ying's COVID-19 labor market task force has provided us with some preliminary data. Over 2,000 job positions have been abolished. 70% of those have been in the tourist sector and 10% in the uh, retail and distri distribution sector. Um, remittance flow, however, have remained quite steady. Uh, the overall decline in the economy is projected to be about 11%. And the impact is obviously going to result in reduced export earnings, weakened production performance, and fall off in investment. So when we look specifically at some of the impact of the labor market um, in terms of the employer-employee relationship, what we have seen is a reduction in income and that either as a result of an agreement between employers and employees to have um, income reduced, or in some cases, as we have, have heard, a unilateral decision of employers to reduce wages, or wages have been reduced as a result of reduced working hours. The impact of all of this is very stark, very clear, and has long-term implications for us. It has resulted in a decline in the disposable income, it leads to higher debt levels and weaker consumer demand. And therefore, the crisis, certainly for countries like Jamaica, exposes certain vulnerability. And one of the things that is quite evident in, um, in Jamaica and countries of a similar nature are two things. One is the negative impact on the own account workers whose livelihood is dependent on the physical proximity and public space. And I mentioned that earlier, that is one of the certainly um, <clears throat> issues that we'll have to contend with in the recovery program. Secondly, is the informal workers um, in Jamaica who are, have no statutory provisions are not protected uh, by, by labor laws. And thirdly, weak employment protective provisions for the regular wage earners. Now, why are these important? These are important because according to the ILO, the recovery, the post COVID recovery is going to be far more difficult for countries that A, have a greater dependency on the service sector, B, have high levels of informality and perhaps about half of Jamaica a uh, uh, working population is, is um, falls into that category. And three, weak safeguards against termination of employment. So that it, certainly Jamaica demonstrates that these three are, are very pronounced in our economy. And therefore what it means is that the recovery program is, is, is going to be even much more difficult for us as against other countries who are not so um, affected. Going forward, therefore, and against the background of those challenges, what then is it that the, the Jamaican government, the Jamaica as a society, as a country, needs to do in order to ensure that our labor market become much more flexible and much more responsive to address the crisis in the shortest possible way. And there are th three or four very important things that one needs to give consideration to. And based upon the ILO's own um, prescription, one, stronger employment policies and institutions need to be put in place to ensure that. Two, better resource and comprehensive social protection system. A, 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 an issue not only identified by the ILO, um, as, as, as one of the challenges 
that led to the um, devastation in many developing countries and obviously a challenge in going forward. But the World Bank has also indicated that social protection is going to be an area of, of focus that has to take place in the recovery uh, program. ECLAC, um, IDB, all, all international um, trading partners and institutions have recognized the importance of social protection as a means of addressing the issue going forward. Third is debt relief measures. And this is an issue which has, um, has surfaced. The ILO has some measures which has, it has put in place to alleviate uh, debt relief on, in a number of countries. I'll speak um, more to that later. And then the fourth area is the use of international labor standards to provide um, the framework for the recovery program. So if we are talking about the recovery, then the legislative component also has to be supported by strong policy measures. And within that context, it is important for us to recognize um, a, 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 a situation that has been made um, much more obvious by both the financial crisis of 2008 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the need for us to ensure that if we want to accelerate and sustain inclusive economic growth, then it has to be set within the context of a decent work agenda. And what exactly do we mean by decent work? And the ILO has spent um, much of its time exploring that. In very simple terms, it means putting money in the pocket of individuals so that they and their families are able to spend the money in the economy and help to keep the economic activities uh, turning. Certainly, it is quite obvious that the increasing levels of purchasing power is an important factor for the growth, development, and sustainability of enterprises, particularly small enterprises. And obviously, this will fuel the need for these um, enterprises to be able to hire more workers and to improve the pay and condition of work. Thirdly, decent work incre it increases tax revenues for governments to make available resources to extend social protection to the most vulnerable groups. And again, I mentioned the fact that the ILO, the World Bank, IMF, IDB all recognize the importance of providing social protection as a way in the post-COVID recovery period. And another important component of the decent work is the promotion of social dialogue among the various stakeholders, the unions, government, uh, public private sector workers, etc., cetera, to, uh, to, to ensure that there is a, a, a inclusiveness in whatever policy prescriptions may be decided upon. And in, in the context of all of that, we need to ensure that there's always a, a, a gender component which becomes a cross-cutting theme in all of our policy uh, prescriptions. The freedom of association, which is enshrined in our constitution, which guarantees workers the right um, to form or join a trade union of his or her choice, is an important element of the decent work agenda. And so too is the question of the decent work providing employment, which provides dignity, hope, and a sense of justice for workers and help in maintaining social peace. So that if, if the recovery program is to be effective, is to be accelerated, is to be inclusive, and is to lead to economic development, then it has to be set within the context of the decent work agenda. And we have to look at the legislations within our labor market that can help to strengthen that as well as broader social policies which must act as a philip to that and i think it it, it, um, it is very important because as we heard um, earlier that the question of labor markets and other markets are are, are social construct and that what always lag behind is the legislative support to accelerate the pace of that. And here's an opportunity that COVID has provided for us now to look now at developing those legislative changes 
creating the labor market reform, the labor reform um, that will help us to be able to support the need to drive the recovery program along the lines I've previously outlined. In the Jamaican context, a number of legislation comes readily to mind. And so these are certainly um, labor laws that would certainly need to be reviewed. Our Employment Termination and Redundancy Payment Act, our Labor Relations and Industrial Disputes Act, our Labor Relations Code, Occupational Safety and Health, Maternity Leave Act, National Minimum Wage Act. These are critical importance by, not, by no means the, an exhaustive list, but the, I think they point to the very core issues which we have to take on board if we are going to begin to look at the recovery in a post-COVID era. The, in addition to that, and again, um, speakers have made mention of that. In addition to having these reform of our labor laws, it is very important that they must be sustained by some other policy prescriptions and programs that can help to enhance and improve the general well-being and welfare of the economy. So productivity improvement becomes critical. And so therefore there has, there, there has to be measures put in place to seek to improve productivity. Livable wage, we have a, a minimum wage, but I think we have to recognize that the economy has to set its sight on trying to become robust and to evolve and to develop in a manner that can accommodate a livable wage component rather than a minimum wage. And I think there's some batteries is low. And the, the, the other thing is improve work ethics. Sorry, yeah, improve work ethics. And again, and, and soft de skills development. And again, um, Professor Ying raised a question about the, the kind of uh, uh, soft skills training that we need to, to, to get into. And I, it, it's not rocket science. I think that there's, I mean, hard trust and other institutions can begin to address those issues um, about our soft skills development or work ethics, et cetera, because these are important considerations to help to boost and to drive economic growth and increase levels of productivity. And of course, the question of social dialogue always becomes important because there's a need to ensure that there's inclusiveness, there's an understanding, there's a buy-in from all the stakeholders when it comes to the kind of a policy prescriptions and the kind of a development agenda that we're pursuing for economic growth and development. So, what is it that these labor laws need to focus on? And I've identified them because they would fall into these three areas. If the labor market is to respond adequately and to provide the kind of sustained economic growth in a post-COVID era, then in the first place, the legislations, the reform of our labor laws, must focus on three critical areas identified again by the ILO in its analysis of the, uh, the impact of COVID on, on the workplaces. One, job protection, income protection, social protection. And in that regard, and again, this has been alluded to by many of the speakers, question about the unemployment insurance, um, becomes an issue for consideration. Issues are relating to strengthening them, our employment protective legislations, guaranteeing work a livable wage, providing statutory protection for the most vulnerable groups like our domestic workers, contract workers, etc., etc., are going to be very important in terms of the focus of, of, of our labor law reform in order to be able to address the very critical issues that I mentioned earlier as to what are some of the weaknesses that we have in our labor market that needs to be overcome if we are to accelerate the pace and to achieve the level of sustained growth that is necessary in the post-COVID period. Let's look at the need for employment protection. 
this is an issue that ILO conventions, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU Labor Laws have, spoke, have given consideration to. The question of how do you protect workers from uh, arbitrary dismissals and, and, and loss of jobs, which can have very serious impact upon them. Although we have some element of employment protective legislation in Jamaica, it certainly needs to be strengthened. There needs to be greater strength and a much more robust approach to um, the protective uh, laws to guarantee jobs that, than we currently have. And the importance of that, obviously, is uh, the fact that we need to ensure that workers are not unfairly or unjustly dismissed because of the impact that that can have, not only on the worker, but on his family, but also has implications for the wider economy in terms of uh, insecurity, poverty, uh, social um, misdeeds, etc. So these are very important. What we have found as the, as the economy evolves and as uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution begins to uh, take up, uh, accelerate, and uh, as the world begins to give very serious consideration pre-COVID to the question of the, the world of work and what it entails with robotics and technology, et cetera. What we have seen is uh, certainly in the last 20 years or more is the introduction of contract workers um, as, a, as a means of classifying workers into two categories. One which moves them away from the normal protection that would have been developed through collective bargaining and other labor legislations, of, certainly in Jamaica's case, of the category of workers. Um, and that definition did, does, does not include contract workers um, who, who would therefore be outside of any kind of a, a statutory protection that our present law provides. And the, obviously the, the most obvious example of that is our security guards. And therefore our laws need to ensure that all workers, be they contract workers or otherwise, are brought under the same protective legislation and are provided with the kind of uh, protection that is entailed in the concept of decent work. The use of temporary and part-time workers have also been a feature of our employment relationship over the last three or so decades. And again, the, the, our laws are inadequate in addressing that. In a number of other jurisdictions, there's a limit placed to the number of years that you can have a person who operates as a temporary or part-time worker. And therefore, we need to give consideration to amending our legislation to ensure that a person is not a temporary or part-time worker ad infinitum. That after a certain number of years, then it certainly demonstrates that there's a need for some permanency in that position and that that needs to take place. Research has shown us that, that these employment protective legislations um, doesn't hinder the efficient allocation of labor, as some people would argue, or have any negative effect upon job creation and economic growth, as some um, scholars have pointed out. But in fact, the U and certainly it is becoming even more so pronounced now in this uh, COVID era, that the use of the employment protective legislation has the potential to boost productivity growth and can lead to job creation and improve economic and social conditions for the worker. And so this is a very important area for, of, of protection that our law needs to incorporate. In terms of income protection, we have spoken about uh, unemployment uh, insurance as one such um, measure. And again, um, I repeat, many countries um, have recognized the importance of using unemployment uh, insurance as a buffer uh, during the the, uh, the pandemic crisis and um, the lockdown that has occurred. And so therefore there has to be 
Um, in fact, that debate has long been on the agenda in Jamaica, and I think that all COVID has done is to accelerate it, um, and it, it certainly in, in, in time. And over 100 countries have, have some form of unemployment protection schemes because of the recognition of how important it is to maintain income as a means of driving economic activity and maintaining uh, businesses. One of the policy considerations I think that the government has to give careful uh, examination to um, is the question of the use of, of, of a wage subsidy. Um, I moved to the idea during the midst of the, the, the crisis that I think that rather than having cash handouts, that a wage subsidy perhaps would have been a better approach um, because of the more structural impact that it has on, on the economy. Certainly, it, 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 it addresses one of the foremost problems that countries like Jamaica faces, which is the um, in, income inequality. And it gives us an opportunity to begin to redress those distributional inequity that exists within our economy. So it's something that, need, that needs to be, to be examined. We need to do some research on it to see uh, what form of waste subsidy is best for Jamaica, if at all, um, it, is, it is a viable um, option. The introduction of a livable wage to replace the minimum wage, again, an important um, protective element to whatever legislative support that we may have. Um, the importance of having low wage earners, having a, a level of disposable income that can help to propel and stimulate economic activities become very important. And again, it's something certainly we need to look at. So the reform of our labor, of our labor laws, the, the employment protection, the income protection, um, social protection is, is, is critically important because what that does is to ensure that we follow through on some of the major tenets of the decent work agenda to provide livable wage to workers to have them feel protected um, both in terms of from the health standpoint as well as what provides the, the kind of a dignity um, that is evident in ILO declarations, the, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, etc. Very, very important. Well, one of the considerations that I'd like to certainly put on the table is the question of debt relief. And again, I know that this is a matter that has come up. Uh, the IMF has um, decided to provide debt relief for a number of countries with a, a per capita income of 1,175 US dollars or less, um, which, is the, which is in the normal scheme of things, the, uh, the conditions for debt forgiveness under their IMF catastrophe containment and relief trust. Well, I'm, I'm making the point that, that in the COVID era, that that criteria ought not to be used and that we really need to look at the debt to GDP ratio as a, as a, 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 and develop that as a criteria for debt forgiveness. And this is something that Jamaica obviously can't go alone. And therefore we have to join forces with other uh, developing countries in um, the ACP grouping, you know, um, third world countries that can begin to lobby for, um, for greater debt relief from international um, lending agencies so that more resources will be made available to begin to address the issues of the vulnerability um, of, of certain groups, um, provide better you know, um, support for, for, for the various groups within society, etc. All conditions that every one of the international agencies have pointed to as absolutely necessary if the recovery in the post-COVID era is to take place and take place in a sustained and, and um, purposeful way. So consideration has to be given to that. And I think that, that Jamaica, for example, has had to seek to draw down some money from the National Housing Trust, which it, 
is to provide housing for, for um, Jamaican workers. Um, I think that if we look at providing debt relief um, through some special uh, window under the IMF Catastrophe Containment and Relief Trust, it would place less of a reliance on the NHD funds, which can be used also to help subsidize more housing, which is again, another critical component of, of, of social development. So I think that that has to be something that has to be taken into account. F finally, I think again, a, a number of speakers have spoken about that. We can't, as, as much as we, we need to reconceptualize we need to decolonize our education system um, and to recognize the importance of education as not only a means of skills development, as important as that is, that is but also in terms of attitudinal changes about um, developing our capacity to, to deal with savings, to deal with productivity, to deal with social relations, to learn to treat people with dignity and respect. All of these need to be uh, curriculum development issues, which must be taught from the primary school, early childhood education up. And, and certainly the, the, you know, the effects of that would be felt in another 10, 15, um, 20 years from now. But this soft skills element to, to buttress the technical skills that we that are going to be necessary as we move into the the, the digital um, wor world of work, those soft skills training are going to be critically important and must complement that. And that is something that we can begin now. It, it, it's really, as I mentioned earlier, it's not rocking science to begin to develop some of these soft skills uh, training courses to complement. Um, our, our curriculum as we go forward. So that's a very important area. Work ethics, um, one of the issues identified by the um, World Bank um, as one of the weaknesses in Jamaica's competitiveness has, is, is, is um, work ethics. We have to begin to work on that and try to ensure that we get people the right attitude and approach to uh, to business, to work, to development, etc. Productivity improvement. We need a productivity culture in Jamaica where everything is revolves around productivity improvement. And I've, I've, I've often said that the emphasis should more, be more on productivity improvement rather than wage increase, because out of the productivity improvement, then you can begin to look at is, issues of, of of equity and disposal of, 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 of um, the, the value added from that. And of course, social dialogue, as I had mentioned earlier. So are Jamaicans labor law fit for purpose? The answer clearly, no, not yet. But this is an opportunity for us to be able to um, make the necessary changes that are critical in identifying what are the issues that are profoundly important in the development of an economy that must be underpinned by the focus on human capital development and putting people first. In fact, the, the ILO only la last year um, had produced its World of Work um, report um, in which it made the, the very poignant point that the central issue in advancing the world of work has to be emphasis on putting people first. It has to be human centric, and therefore that is akin to looking at the uh, concept of the decent work agenda. Right? We have to um, strengthen our uh, our weak employment protective legislation. We have to address our inadequate social protection. 
um, the question of the unemployment insurance issue has to be really examined carefully to see if that is the best option. Uh, not by any means uh, um, saying that it has to be that, but certainly we need to have some form of social protection and income and job protection as well. So I think that if we have all of that, and if we um, have the supporting social policies and the right attitude, uh, the emphasis on productivity improvement, and so on, that I think that we would be able to ensure that whatever changes we have made to our labor laws, structural changes, important changes to provide that in the income protection, social protection, and, and job protection, um, that it will ensure that beyond those labor law changes are the right supporting and enabling uh, structures that would be in place to help drive the process towards uh, economic development and growth. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat. However, because of time constraints, I am just going to pull a few and see how best we can crunch, crunch this, these questions into the little time we have. So we have a question that says, um, many companies are now permanently looking for to have staff work from home. How can collective bargaining and labor legislations be amended to include this new arrangements and arrangement and what benefits or obligations should it include both from the employer and employee side? Well, first of all, we have a flexible work arrangement policy that includes as one of the elements um, working from home, remote work. And, and we, in developing that a couple of years ago, 2015, I think we had passed it through the policy. One of the important considerations that looking at the flexible work arrangement was because we recognized that it had the potential to improve productivity, create better work-life balance, and was certainly a, a way in which Jamaica could advance um, economically. COVID has only accelerated that, and therefore we need to um, begin to focus on that. But the second thing is that we need to develop a work from home policy. Certainly at the Institute, we have um, developed work from home policies for a number of organizations. Um, again, it, it, it shows from recent research that, that, that has been done. In fact, in the last 10 years, uh, um, it, it, globally, there has been an acceleration to working from home. And the benefits of that has been, you know, research has shown that in, in many instances, um, it can result in improved efficiency, productivity, better work attitude, etc. But even if, if, but if we introduce a work from home policy, we also have to introduce an element of trading because a lot of, uh, there, there's a downside to working from home because we are, uh, as human beings, our primal instinct is to socialize. Um, we have to talk about that. We have to talk about the attitude to work because we don't want people to think that um, working from home is a, is a, potential holiday period. And so the, 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 the attitude to work has to be a critical component. Uh, countries like Jamaica is said um, that it's about 17% of the jobs and occupations that may very well lend itself to um, on the work from home kind of arrangements. But it is something that we need to examine and certainly um, it needs to, to, we need to ensure that persons who work from home do not feel themselves in a less favorable position than persons who work at the office and that their right to, to, to collective bargaining arrangements still remains in place, etc. These, of course, will have to be fit form into, into some uh, well, labor relations and industrial disputes act or some other form of legislations to give it um, statutory um, support and provision. But certainly it, it, it's, it's, it's the need to develop these work from home policies and to begin to train people to understand and appreciate how it needs to manifest itself is something that we need to focus on. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we have a, another question that is asking about um, any plans to improve the current Paternity Leave Act, if you're aware of any plans to, come to do anything in that respect. Well, that, that idea has been mooted certainly by the Jamaica Civil Service Association. Um, and um, research that we have done uh, shows that the majority of public sector workers would, would certainly support it. It has to be lobbied for, it has to be, um, this is where the social dialogue becomes very instructive because it has to be put on the agenda of the Labor Advisory Committee and seen as an important consideration. And again, when we introduced these things, it was maternity leave laws to be amended because a little be, be behind what the international best practices um, currently exist. But again, to put these laws, make these changes, it, we, we have to begin to change attitude and approach and work ethic as well. Okay. And the final question, I have more, but we can't take all of them, but the final one I'll take, it says, over five years, there has been call for greater productivity in all sectors of the labor market. And despite constant findings that resources is the biggest hindrance, there has yet to be an objective to look at this limiting factor, how this limiting factor can be addressed. What are your recommendations in this regard? So I guess it's about greater productivity. Yeah, and know. I guess we also have another question that kind of links with that, that asks if productivity should place greater emphasis on creativity and innovation. We have new measures of productivity. So I guess you can probably take both. Yeah, we have a, a, a productivity council, Jamaica Productivity Council, um, and we have a, a, a board that manages that. Um, we, 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 we're kind of weak. One of the problems, and uh, I mean, Professor Ying probably need to take up, take up this in his, I know he wants to retire and leave us. But the question of implementation, I've raised it as an issue. It's probably a, a, a subject that needs to be taught at the university. We have an implementation deficit. We have ideas. We, we, we speak about it. We ask for the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have been talking about soft skills development, et cetera. We need to begin to, to implement some things and it's, they're not difficult to implement. We need to get companies to begin to buy into productivity improvement schemes and methods. It, 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 is, it can be done. It, it, it's not rocket science. And I just cannot, it's, it's, a, it's a weakness that we have, it seems to be a regional weakness about implementing good ideas and policies that we have. And perhaps we need now to focus on getting a course in implementation to, to, to begin to address some of these issues. But I mean, it, it, we have our occupational safety and health bill that has been languishing for nearly 30 years. Yeah, that's as much as I can say. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Okay, so now we have come to the end of this presentation. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to all the participants who are still with us. I mean, I know that this is probably lunchtime for most. So I do hope that you have your lunch nearby so you can eat and listen in at the same time so you don't have to leave us because we still have two presenters to go. Um, coming up on your screen momentarily will be the poll for you to rate this pres this presentation that has ended. So could you please just quickly input your answers? Thank you. So we'll be. So we have to pull up for another 10 seconds and then we'll close off. Great. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Now we'll do the quick, now we'll do the question for this section. But before I do that question, I'd like to congratulate Sanika. So unfortunately, I don't have Sanika's last name, but she was the winner of the third quick question, the third token. Now, the question for this presentation, right, it says, identify one piece of legislation 
mentioned by the presenter that needs to be reviewed. And you see your prizes there. And um, that USB card is, includes the ESSJ 2019. So for all of those who may need the ESSJ for their research or their work, hurry up and get on board so you can win that copy of the 2019 ESSJ. Okay, and thank you very much. Now, we're just gonna break up the, all that talking for just about 30 seconds. Um, because what we want you to all know that is in everything we do, we are guided by the Vision 2030 Jamaica. That is the plan that lays out where we as a country, where we are going, what we hope to achieve. And so I would like you to look at this, this clip for 30 seconds on the whole Vision 2030 Jamaica process. You're muted, Madam Host. I am sorry, my apologies. Um, so we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. So in that case, we will move ahead with our next presenter, Mr. Donovan Cunningham. Mr. Donovan Cunningham is a human resource practitioner currently employed to the National People's Cooperative Bank of Jamaica in the capacity of HR manager. He is currently a board member of the JPS and Partners Cooperative Credit Union, where he chairs the board in the capacity of president. His academic qualifications include postgraduate training in labor laws, a bachelor of science degree in human resource management, an associate of science degree in business administration and general management train and training and certification. And he has previously worked with the Jamaica Public Service Company in the capacity of parish manager, where he was responsible for the parishes of Manchester and Clarendon. He is an intrinsically motivated volunteer and lay magistrate who spends most of his time, his leisure time, with the Rotary Club of Christiana. He firmly supports and underscores the philosophy of Elizabeth Andrews. Volunteers do not necessarily have time, they just have heart. And at this point, I would like to welcome Mr. Cunningham, and he was at his presentation and he will be looking at and he's doing some insights on the COVID-19 experience and he's doing it from the standpoint of an employer because we also want the opinions of persons on the other side not just employees but also the views of the employers so Mr. Cunningham over to you No, Mr. Cunningham, I'm seeing him, but I'm not hearing him. Hello. Yes, hello, Still Mr. Hearing Cunningham. Now? Hearing okay. you now. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, so I, first let me thank you all for the invitation extended for me to participate in this forum and just to provide some insights as to how COVID-19 has impacted the industry for which I'm a part, which is the service sector. I must say that I'm gonna be condensing my presentation because I did um, indicate that I had another obligation elsewhere by one o'clock. And as such, I'm only going to go through the very salient points and for those questions that persons would like to ask, I'm gonna ask that, you know, you take them, send them to me via email and I'll be sure that I'll address them and return the answers. All right, so COVID-19 has had deleterious impact, especially on our tourism, hospitality industry, 
the transportation sector, and most of all, the service industry. This has caused severe business disruption. This has caused severe business dis disruption. As I, um, from our standpoint, we have seen a decline in uptake of our products and services. We have seen increased delinquency where members have been coming into us because they have passed due their repayment time and have been asking us for all sorts of facilities. We have also noticed an increase in fraudulent activities as persons normally use this opportunity when they think that you're most vulnerable to make an attempt to attack. When the government introduced the disaster risk management program, one thing that was very clear to us was that we needed to have had a business continuity plan, which we did have. And that has basically helped us to stay afloat thus far because we were able to roster our employees. We were able to pay special attention to their health and their safety while continuing to provide service to our members who needed us, especially our most vulnerable, which is our pensioners. We have had to be communicating, 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 and I can't overemphasize this, that businesses need to communicate with their employees and not only their employees, but also their customers, because especially if you're in a service industry, people want to know what exactly is happening. And all the presenters before me has already spoken to the need for us to embrace technology. We are currently in the fourth industrial revolution and technology is going to be the way forward because post COVID things will not return as they are before. Mr. Robert spoke just before me and he spoke about the need for some revision of the labor laws. But one thing I would encourage employ, um, businesses to do, especially now, is that we need to show empathy to our employees and also to our customers. Pay special attention to our, um, your employees' welfare and their mental health. A number of industries, all we are pushing is productivity. But what use is productivity at this time when there are no takers for the product or services that you're, you're um, producing? Employees need you to engage, to show empathy, to demonstrate to them that you understand what is happening and that you not only understand, but you're willing to hold their hands so that collectively everybody can emerge from this pandemic together. We have moved to agile business continuity planning by allowing remote working. And we have bolstered this by our IT system. We have also allowed employees who have the means of working away from home. In instances, we have gone and supplemented like their utility bills, because if they were in our offices, they would have been using the electricity paid for by our, our telephone used by the organization. But now you're encroaching on your personal space, even though they are working and still contributing to your organization and making themselves productive. We have also had to be paying attention to their health by asking them to take periodic breaks from, from their, their areas that they're sitting because they have now transformed their homes into offices. And these, most of the times you get more out of your employees when you show empathy this way. But sitting at your desk for very long periods, we now develop sedentary lifestyles. And therefore I'm encouraging persons, employers especially, and business owners who are on the program to make sure that you Encourage your staff, encourage your workers to take periodic breaks because that's the only way that you're going to prevent them from having sedentary uh, lifestyle diseases developing that later on you're going to know be treating with by having to give extended leave.
a slightly stuck. Uh, all right, so you also have to identify key persons that are able to take your businesses forward and make sure that you have simulation exercise so that when you have a pandemic, today we have a health pandemic. What prohibits us from tomorrow having another natural disaster? So we, it, is, it is necessary for you to identify from very early on persons that are able to take your business forward. Invest in them and have them do simulations so that there's seamless business process continuity should you have a pandemic or another natural disaster hit us. Rasta, your staff. Again, Mr. Roberts spoke about the legislation that we had where flexi time is available. Most times co companies go for the first, in the first instance, as soon as they have any disaster, or any difficulty, they go to labor and they cut labor first. But there's an alternative where you can have the discussion with your employees, roster them because at this time everybody needs to be earning. And therefore it shows your employees that not only are you thinking strategically, but you're also interested in their welfare and how it is that they are going to take care of their obligations going forward. So you have to show empathy. You have to engage your, your, your employees, as I said earlier on, by showing that you are interested in them. You have to upskill your employees at this time. The traditional skills that we had many years ago, post COVID will not return. Things are, jobs are going to be done differently and there are going to be new skills that are going to be emerging. As such, unless you're upskilling yourself and helping your employees to upskill themselves, they are going to be left behind because the modern way of doing things requires you to embrace, as I said earlier, on technology and also for you to grow your industry and to stay relevant, you're going to have to re remain as current as is humanly possible. We are going to have to um, lobby our government at this time to look at the feasibility of employment insurance to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. Even though we have the Employee Redundancy and Termination Act, many persons right now would rather to be earning no matter how small it is, rather than getting a lump sum in their hand and have no future jobs. So it's critical that we lobby our legislators to look favorable on providing employment insurance, as this might be the way forward, and also to encourage in, um, industries and businesses as they emerge from COVID-19. As many persons are now skittish to invest because they cannot contend with labor, or the, 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 the issue of having to pay redundancy, even when their businesses are not making any money. And the final thing I want to leave with you this afternoon, emerging from what, uh, from our insight, from what we have seen with the onset of COVID is that we should use the downtime available presently to reposition our organization and focus on the critical areas that we will be needing to push our growth. Post-COVID is going to require a number of stuff being done differently. We are, as I said earlier on, in the fourth industrial revolution. We have to embrace technology. We have to embrace labor, but we also have got to prepare our people for the road ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cunningham. I am sad that you have to leave, that you're not able to that, that you're not able to facilitate any questions, but thank you so much for staying. Um, I'm sure you'll be sharing up your presentation with us so that we can share it with the persons.
who are who are at this forum so that they will have it. And as you said, for persons who have questions, then we can, you can send the questions, we will forward it to you and you can respond. But thank you again very much for staying. Thank you too, Ms. Richards. And I, I again apologize for hurrying away, but I have a one o'clock, which is off campus and um, I have quite a bit of driving to do. Okay, okay. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Good. So okay. Okay, so at this point, we will do the poll for this present, for the presentation that just ended and the poll will be coming on your screen now. And again, you will rank the session across the various options available. Um, I'm not seeing my poll question. Oh, okay, here it is, right, there it is. Okay, and thank you very much. So we'll end the poll now. And thanks, thank you again. Okay, um, at this point, first we will do the, the question for this presentation. And, but before we do the question for this presentation, I would like to congratulate the the winner of the last poll, that was Mr. Oral Lawson. He won the question on Mr. Robert's presentation. For other persons who have won prizes, and you, if you have not yet sent your email address to Ms. Roxine Ricketts in the chat, could you please do so, so that we can contact you with your prizes? And well, as the question was on screen, so when I noticed persons are already I already sent in answers in the chat. It says select a key strategy highlighted by the presenter to ensure business continuity in the aftermath of COVID-19. And you have four options, A, B, C, or D. So you can select. Very good, very good. And now we will have the Vision 2030 um, video and after which we will have the final presenter. Thank you very much. And now there's one thing I need you to do. The first person who can put, and this, this is now open to PIOJ staff. So any members of any member of staff of the PIOJ who is on, who's in the forum, you're not allowed to answer this question. The first person who can put the vision statement in the chat will win a token from Vision 2030 Jamaica.
And while you do, you respond to that challenge, I would like to introduce the final speaker for today, who will also be giving insights into the COVID-19 experience. And she is Mrs. Loy Walters. Mrs. Loy Walters is a human resource practitioner with over 25 years experience, having worked in various public sector entities, including the Education and Health Ministries, Jamaica Customs, and the Office of the Services Commission. Over the years, she has managed portfolios in such as Director for Manpower Planning, Director Human Resource Management and Development, and Senior Deputy Chief Personnel Officer. She is presently the Principal Director for Human Resource Policy and Information in the Strategic Human Resource Management Division at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. Mrs. Walters is the first female president of the Human Resource Management Association of Jamaica and is an HR subcommittee member of the Cannabis Licensing Authority. She was a member of the UE Career and Placement Committee and the first board of the Tax Administration Jamaica and became the chair of his HR subcommittee. She has also taught as an associate lecturer at the Management Institute for National Development. Mrs. Walters has a bachelor's degree in literature in English, a master's degree in human resource development, and a postgraduate diploma in public sector senior management. Professionally, she has pursued a number of programs, such as the Public Sector Senior Leadership Development Program, the Advanced Inter-American Policy and Innovation Management Program, and the Commonwealth Executive Program in Public, public Management. She is also a Prosky Certified Change Practitioner and a Trainer of Trainers. Her areas of expertise include HR policy development, human resource management and development, leadership development, team building, customer service, interpersonal relationships, and professionalism. And as stated before, Mrs. Walters will be speaking to us on the whole HR perspectives coming out of this whole COVID experience. Mrs. Walters, over to you. Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. I know I'm standing between you and lunch. And so I have been asked by Antoinette and everyone at the PIOJ to make a presentation to you on how, on who, who is Hermage and how we navigated the COVID-19 storm. And so let's go. Are you seeing my screen, Antoinette? Okay. Yes, I am. 40 years ago, this organization was launched under the name of JATA, Jamaica Association for Training and Development. I see Professor Ying um, is still going strong. He was one of the icons and so we salute him. And in July 19, in 2005, to broaden the appeal to include all the cadre of HR professionals, the organization was rebranded and it is now the hum Human Resource Management Association of Jamaica, the premier HR association in Jamaica. Hermag is an internationally recognized HR association influencing performance and productivity, which seeks to operate as a vibrant and proactive organization, providing value added services to our members, our partners, associates, and the wider community as we influence policy, promoting organizational growth and development of human capital. We just saw the video of the Vision 2030. Jamaica, the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. And Hermad is really passionate about that and passionate about employing our members, our fellow citizens in this area. And so we had to now dig deep when COVID happened. And when COVID happened, we discovered that we were more resilient, Antoinette, than we thought we were. And so we, in digging deep, we got better, we got stronger, we had to leverage technology, shift horizons, we had to navigate new journeys and stories in this coronavirus storm. 
because this is the greatest disruption the world has ever seen. And Hermod was challenged by this disruption as well. And so in light of COVID, this, and in despite COVID, we did several things. Firstly, we examined the labor market reg regulations, particularly, you know, and Mr. Roberts went into great detail about that. We looked at sick leave in light of COVID and we recommended national workplace considerations for managing sick leave in relation to COVID. And we sent that out from on March 11, 2020. So if you need to see that, you can just contact us and we'll let you know. We also focused on labor productivity by emphasizing the strategic importance of HR in ensuring business continuity as a critical business partner in the labor market as organizations try to pivot. We also provided learning and development opportunities, support and HR advice at this time. We worked closely and are still working closely with the PSOJ in underscoring the importance of occupational health and safety in our labor force while allowing for flexibility in our workspaces. We also focused on human capital development of our leaders and our HR professionals by having workshops and seminars, some of them customized. We also had masterclass and, and we also had a masterclass conference. This is our 40th year and we had our first virtual masterclass conference focusing on resilient leadership for a disruptive future. We also relaunched our code of ethics and there, because we, we are the community voice for all our members, you know, because we want better workplaces, we want fair workplaces, we want ethical workplaces. And so we relaunched our code of ethics at this time. We also introduced to everyone our human resource management young professionals, you know, because you have different levels of persons in the organization. And so we will, you'll hear more about that in 2021. And we have also launched our Caribbean HR Management Institute because we, are, we want to research human resource practices in the Caribbean. We want our own research. We find that a lot of times persons are quoting research from overseas, but local research is not readily available in an institute. And so we are, we are going to provide that as well. We also focused on flexibility in employment by conducting a flexible work arrangement survey between March and April. And that data was shared with the National Competitive Council to inform on flexi work. The other thing we did, Antoinette and everyone on this call, we focused on fostering HR's ability to create supportive policies by developing a work from home policy template. You can access it, access it. Everyone can access it. You can just call us at Hermaj and we will give it to you. We shared it with the private sector and persons all across the Caribbean. And so if you need that kind of help, Hermaj is here to support you in this regard. We also had targeted workshops such as a guide to negotiating employment contracts post COVID and remote work and 120 days into COVID, re-engage or separate. And we did other things like that in order to meet the needs of our stakeholders. And so looking ahead to 2021 and beyond, we encourage all players in the labor market to recognize that this time of change and transition stretches our minds. And so we have to embrace ambiguity, uncertainty and complexity leading to endings, neutral zones, new beginnings, and never allowing ourselves to return to our original dimension. As the other speakers spoke to, we have to look ahead. How can we help our country and our region to manage in this new era? We have to know that disruption is usual. Disruption is something that's going to happen all the time. We have to get used to that. We have to prepare for the future of work with all the skills technical and soft skills, as well as employability. We have to seek out reasons behind the Jamaican workers' low productivity. Jamaica workers don't work for several reasons. 
mistrust of leaders and managers, non-productive behavior as a form of resistance against the hostile culture of work, not feeling that they will benefit from being more productive. They said the organization will benefit, will get more profit, but we won't benefit. That's how persons feel. Some of them suffer from lack of proper training and appreciation and recognition. And so we have to seek out those and other reasons and see how we can address the errors. We, can't, we have been talking about low productivity for years, but we have to look at the reasons and attack each reason one by one and, and change that. We also want to encourage players to increase labor productivity by inculcating a strong work ethic in our people, in our human resources from childhood to adulthood. We, you know, sometimes we focus on the workplace so much that we don't remember that human resources start, you start as, as, as Dr. Rita said, she focused a lot on from childhood, from, from, from pregnancy, that you know, work ethic starts there and it starts with our children. So what are we telling our children now? Are we saying to them, you don't need to go to school, you don't need to work? No, we are saying to them, a strong work ethic starts from there and all the way up in our workplaces. Mr. Roberts spoke to the Jamaica labor laws, we need to update the labor legislation soon so that we can speak to things like paternity leave and other areas in that setting. We also need to prevent burnout of staff and HR practitioners. Now that people are working from home, there's a blurring of the line. There's a blurring of the line between home and work and persons are suffering from burnout. And so we have to be careful. We also have to collaborate with HR professionals and leaders. We have to pay attention to that. We also need to drive human capital development, ladies and gentlemen. We have to reframe our education system that was spoken to a lot today to develop a culture of experimentation, creative thinking and learning from failure. We need to know that it's okay to make mistakes and we need to learn from them. When people are bored, people create things. You, if you look at social media now, you'll find that a lot of young people are creating things because they are bored. They are creating Broadway plays, for instance, on TikTok. So those are some of the things we need to look at. We also need to encourage everyone to engage in lifelong learning with comprehensive learning, lifelong learning strategies and source the right programs. Hermage is here to help you with that. And so we want you to pay attention to that, ladies and gentlemen. With that, I hope, I, I know I didn't have much time, Antoinette, but I thank you so much for you and Mrs. Coy and all the persons, Dr. Henry, for inviting Hermage to be on this platform. And we are here to answer any questions. I'm not running away, I've been here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Walters. Um, one of the questions I would like to start off by asking you, because it's something that I heard a, a lot of persons have been discussing during this whole COVID period. Um, and since you are, you have done training and you're a certified change management practitioner, mm -hmm. how do we change the minds or the beliefs of some of our senior managers who are probably in a different age group who believe mm -hmm. that work is a physical place i have to be able to see you the to culture. believe that you're doing work that whole right. culture of so how do we start that whole way of getting them to think differently that you don't have to see me step out of your office and see me mm -hmm. for me to still be delivering on the targets i should be able to work from home and still deliver how do we start that mindset change in our various organizations okay change so the issue is not so much change antoinette the issue is transition management how do we deal with this new ending you hear, I spoke about it a while ago. How do we deal with this new ending that the geography of work has shifted? You know, how do we deal with the new beginnings that will result of that? It starts at the top. It starts, change begins with an executive sponsor. And so at the top of the organization, you have to set the example. So the person at the top has to be able to say, okay, this is the direction we are going to go. What do we need to do? Because how, how are you going to do the how are you going to do that cultural shift? You have to look at what are your business processes. Do you need to re-engineer the business processes? Do you need to now have output focused job descriptions? Do you need to now say 
this is what the deliverable is. And so that you say to the, the work, the, you have to prove it sometimes to some of these persons because they have to remember now that the baby boomers are the ones that invented the 60 hour work week. And they, they are there. The millennials are not going to stay in the office for 60 hours. I can, you can be guaranteed that they would prefer to have a compressed work week and, and be have Friday off to start their weekend. And so you have to, to, to work with those persons at the top by speaking to them, by showing them what deliverables. So you have to, they have to now be able to articulate. You have to have strong performance management systems, strong policies that would guide. So when you say to the persons, what do you want me to do? I want you to do, for example, to write a policy. If you are going to write a policy, when do you want it delivered? It doesn't matter when I do it. I could be up doing my eight hours from midnight to 8 a.m. But you want it by Friday, it will be ready for Friday. And so we have to be able, we have to let go of that culture that we are on the plantation and that we are looking and looking over people's shoulders and be able to say, what is it that we want people to deliver, Anthony? But it starts at the top, the executive sponsor the person who heads the organization. So I guess I'm putting it on Dr. Henry for your organization, but for any other organization, it starts with the top. When the top, when the top sets the example and leads, their, and leads their senior management team, they will follow when they see they have no choice. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Walters. Oh, you can stop sharing your screen now so we can have you on spot. Oh, okay, sure. No, no problem. Okay. I have another question for you. It says, it's from Mr. Lawson. It says, does more attention need to be paid to the application of organizational behavior therapy to the job sectors in Jamaica? That, that goes without saying. Mr. Lawson answered his own question. You have to. You have to, you have to be able to look at that. You have to be able to say, what is it that the organization needs and how should we behave? We also have to look at behaviors. We have to look at organizational development. You know, we, we, sometimes we are, we are also stuck in looking at how things should be or how things were. You, you, you know, um, one, of your, one of the presenters earlier said, we are focusing so much on what happened in the 50s. We are not focusing on that. We are in a totally different era now. So we have to look at how our systems have been developed, perhaps also making our organizations a little flatter. Okay, thank you very much. My next question is, mm -hmm. is Hermage considering setting up a virtual knowledge network to share HR international best practices for post COVID-19? We are, we are, we are working on it. You know, we are working on it. Knowledge Network will definitely work on it for 2021. 2021 is almost gone, but we'll work on it in the uh -huh. upcoming, upcoming year. I hear Dr. Ying's voice. That's my professor. I can't miss him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, thank you for mentioning the, the beginning of 1980. Yes, sir. <laughs> to be one of the founding members of Jatan, which is now how much. Yes, sir. And one of the power of Jatan in those days was the sharing of information among okay. HR professionals. And that's why I'm suggesting that you move to the next level of this virtual knowledge network. Yes, sir. We'll do. We'll do. We'll be consulting you on it, sir. I was looking more work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, just sharing. Right. My pleasure to do that. All right. Definitely we'll work on that. Okay, um, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I am looking to see if I see any other questions in the chat that's related to you. Sure. Okay, all right, no, I'm not seeing any, but one question, another question I would ask is HR, for HR managers in your ver in their various organization, mm -hmm. what are the top three things that they should focus on to facilitate this new way of work? 
in their focus as because some of them may have policies in place already which require mm -hmm. changing so what would be like the top three things that they should know consider in these in their hr policies going forward to facilitate this new environment that we are working in top three mm -hmm. human resources human resources human resources people it, it, sometimes we so we focus so much on policies and productivity we forget that people are different they are not like machines and so we need to focus on our people we need to focus on crisis management we need to we need to say how are we going to help equip our managers our hr managers and our frontline managers and our all our staff to deal with crisis as the gentleman before me mr Cunningham, said he, he said, if you don't focus on that, there's going to be different things. You know, so what happens if we have another disaster? We have to focus on people. We have to focus on change management. We also have to look at the culture. You mentioned the culture, that culture of persons watching. We have a plantation culture. We have a, a, a non-Nancy culture, a mistrust. And so we have to look at that culture and say, how are we going to change and make that shift? in the organizations because that is the only way we will be able to help people to navigate the space but we have to focus on people if we if we if we forget that there's somebody working from home and that person is facing men, mental issues then we are going to have problems we have to make sure that we balance all of that but focus i would say my top three people all the time human resources Okay. And not just human capital, but people. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Walters. Right. Thank you for giving us the HR perspective on this. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we are now wrapping up. Um, and so the final thing we want to do, the, we have, we'll have we have our, our poll now to rank, to rate Mrs. Walters presentation. And so that poll will be coming up on your screen momentarily. And while we are while we're waiting for it to come up so you can you can view it. Okay. Well, in, while while we're waiting, then I'll move on to the questions. So I asked two questions earlier. The first question, well, the, there was a question related to Vision 2030 and the tagline. I noticed a number of persons answered, um, which says, what is the vision statement? But then in answering, some of you forgot two little words. And on first it said the place, the place to live, work, raise families and do business. But you forgot the off choice in the statement. So the person who gave me the complete statement with the words off choice in it is the winner. And this is Miss Colleen White. That's the person who has won that presentation, the gift for the Vision 2030. I am going to now ask the question from Mrs. Walter's presentation. And the question for this presentation is, in what year was Hermage rebranded? So I hope you all remember, in what year was Hermage rebranded? And there is a token for whoever answers correctly. So could you please enter the information? The wrong question. Oh, well, it's Jack. Wait, 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 okay. In what year did the, 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 the name that it had before, Jatad, become Hermatch? Jatad, yeah. Jatad become rebranded to Hermatch. Yeah. Right. And the persons who are monitoring the chat will tell me when, when we have a winner, and they will notify me as to who the winner is. Um, um, I think they will also send me the information on who won the last question also. So while I await that information, can, um, there will, there's one final, there, is, there seems to be no poll for Miss, Mrs. Walter's presentation. However, there is a general poll 
for the entire day's proceedings. And that poll is now on your screen. So could you please um, select your choices for the two questions on screen currently? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all very much for your responses. Um, I would like to let everyone know that the presentations will be sent out to everyone. So you will be able to review at your own convenience to keep the information to use it in whatever forum you would like to use it in to have discussions even in house with in your various groups. Some of you may be a part of other groupings, other organizations, and you can add value. I think your persons here from the education sector, maybe guidance counselors, persons from schools who may want to take this information back to their students to help to guide what they are doing. I, the winner, I like to know, the winner of the last question is Shanika Campbell, and the answer was two. 2005. Right. So that's so that she is the she is the winner of that question. I'm um, Shanika. I hope we have your email so that we can inform you as to how you can collect your prize. I am still awaiting information on the winner of the question for Mr. Cunningham's presentation. I think oh, I'm seeing it here. And this one seems to be, right, Sabrina Williams. This on the chat, yes. So Sabrina Williams won the, the earlier, the question from Mr. Cunningham. So Sabrina Williams, please send your email information to Roxine Ricketts in the chat so that we can contact you all. At this point, the only thing left for me to say is thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here today. I know we will have to have some, some follow-up discussions, I think, at this point. Um, there are some very important, interesting questions raised. I remember the question that Prof Ying raised earlier about from moving from employability, moving from employment to employability. And there are a number of pointers that have been raised. The team or support team, they have taken note of all the questions that have been posed in the chat and even the responses from our presenters for those that the presenters have responded to. And we are taking this information because one of the things that we, we do post our labor market forums is to see what, what policy recommendations can be made as a result of some of the issues and the, and the things that have been raised in the forum, in the discussion. And this, and this, this is no different. Um, there are lots of things that we have to think about going forward our whole vision 2030 process and a lot of that. And so the information presented here will be critical for, for that whole process of going forward. Um, I have noted in the chat that persons are asking if there are e-certificates for participation. Um, well, that is, we will, normally we, we don't normally do certificates for participation in our labor market forum. It's not something we have ever done before. It may be something that we will con consider in a future forum, but it's not something that we normally do. 
Um, but as I was saying before, a lot of interesting pointers have been raised. A lot of information has been provided. All the presentations will be sent to persons who have registered that we would have had your email information so that you can go through these presentations at your leisure and draw information from it. I want to thank you all again. It's a long day. It has been a very long day, but I would like to thank you all for staying with us to the end. And I hope that you all benefited from this process. I'd like to thank all the persons who have been working in the background, who have been providing tech support, who have been facilitating the smooth flow of today's proceedings. And again, thank you all. And it was my pleasure being your moderator for today. And enjoy the rest of the day. And please be safe and enjoy the season coming up. And all the best to you and your family for 2021. Goodbye. Thank you.